Yep. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, we're alive. And before I pull up the, um, before I pull up the PowerPoint, I want to wait for these last couple of videos to cease uploading because I have a feeling that's going to mess a little bit with the stream quality here. I have 43 seconds, 41 seconds left in this upload. And then there's one more after that. Well, this is a, this is a nice little exercise while people are still filing filing in you guys get to see what i'm uploading right now yeah for publication in the month of march um let me show you let me scroll down here a little bit yeah, so. looks like uh looks like atlanta it is atlanta um a lot of toll express lane stuff and as we go further down here, you can see a lot of Georgia 3DI stuff. So that's what's coming up. At least that's the first batch that's going to come out. There are over 400 videos now in the Georgia folder in my catalog. Yeah. Um, I recorded about 700 new episodes on the Georgia trip. About half of them, over 350 of them, were from Georgia. So, um, and this involved not just Metro Atlanta, but also the interstates radiating out from Atlanta. So you have a lot of coverage. You have all of I-20 in Georgia. Um, I-16 is clinched. You have all of I-85 in Georgia. You have a lot of I-75, at least from Chattanooga to Macon and Warner Robins. Um... So yeah, you just have a ton of stuff statewide. It's it's the channel is in its twelfth year, and it's about time that Georgia gets a boatload of coverage. And a boatload of coverage it'll get. Yeah, Georgia was, I'd say, the last state east of the Mississippi that really didn't have a solid library of footage. Um. And in the last couple of years, I've really tried to tackle the, what I like to call the black holes of coverage, you know, where there's a lot of stuff around a certain area, but then like inside that area, there's nothing. Well, Georgia was one. Right. Uh, the Carolinas was a big one, but I tackled that last year. Michigan was another one that I tackled the year before that. So West Virginia as well. West Virginia was a big one too. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, I'm kind of at the point where I've hit on a lot of the places that I wanted to hit initially with the channel, and now I'm really in the business of filling in gaps. All right, and I know that we've talked, too, about, you know, the filling in the gaps, you know, west of the Mississippi as well, so. Yeah. Which, that's to the, well, that's tonight's episode. <laughs> well, I'm glad you mentioned that, Doug. Yes. Because we are here tonight to talk about one of my favorite cities west of the Mississippi that I've had the pleasure to explore. Um so far in the nearly 12 years of doing this channel and that is kansas city uh missouri and kansas um it's actually two different municipalities that share the same name across state lines but the entire metro area is known as kansas city um i don't think there's really much of a distinction between the states um when talking about the metro it is one of those bi-state metro areas but when people talk about Kansas City, it's kind of it, the the state that you're talking about is kind of irrelevant. <clears throat> but um, we're here to talk about that tonight. And as you might know, you might recognize that guy's voice from being a panelist on here before. But I'm getting to do this show tonight in a special Friday night uh, time slot with uh, Mr. Doug of GribbleNation.org fame. So how are oh, you? word. Uh, yeah, word up, everyone. I don't think we've ever done a uh, a Friday night show before. At least not yeah. at least not one of these. I I don't remember another time when we would have done one. 
No, no, I don't. I, th I know we've done you know, Saturdays and Sundays at different times of the day, but not Friday. Yeah. So it's a little special, you know, Friday night roads. Yes. Sure. Followed by Saturday of, you know, at least in the east, being able to drive around uh, some nice weather, uh, nice mild weather for a change in the winter. Today was gorgeous too. It yeah, was low fifties down uh, down my way in New York metro area, and tomorrow it's going to be just as nice. Apparently, from yeah, from what I hear, yeah. Hey, you take advantage of days like this in in February. Yep, and then it'll be cold again for Super Bowl Sunday. Yeah. Well, speaking of that, we'll talk about that in a second here. But uh, would you like to plug anything on the? Uh, on any blog posts you've written lately or a few things. I know that, um, for instance, on the uh, blog, I actually just, uh, uh, uploaded something this morning on the Sunday river covered bridge in uh, new remain. Um, and I'm going to post a, um, link to that. Uh, basically it's, um, about there's a uh, eight uh, historic covered bridges remaining in, Maine. I've been doing a lot of covered bridge stuff over the winter, but um, I know that a few other things that I was working on, um, there was uh, out in Oregon, there was the John Day fossil beds, um, there was, was US-26, I'm kind of doing a uh, two-part section of that in eastern Oregon, um, and actually I uh, still have to write that last part. And then right now, the other things I'm working on but haven't been uploaded yet, I'm working on the Bridges of Madison County, um, which, you know, with Valentine's Day around the corner, and, you know, basically I think uh, Bridges of Madison County was like a love story or movie. Um, fitting time to do that. And then also the Bailey Hazen Road, which is a uh, road, historic road in Vermont. You can actually still drive portions of it in the northeast kingdom of uh, the green mountain state and i know that um we have some other uh things that you know we have to discuss too um i know that there was a um podcast uh episode that uh, i was a part of you know dan was hosting and then also tom and gribble nation was or other uh, mystery guests uh, we had a uh, podcast about the uh roads of L.A. and Cincinnati. Yeah, and before we talk about that, because that is the content of the next slide, um, I would like to say you have already seen uh, the stuff I'm uploading right now for the month of March. For the rest of this month, February, um, more Carolinas interstates. I think we're working through I-85 right now, and we're going to be transitioning to I-40 next. Uh, across, say, Winston-Salem, Greensboro, and I think I'm going as far as Durham with this batch. I don't exactly remember how far I'm going, but anyway, you're going to see a lot of 85 and 40, and then some other stuff like 77 in South Carolina, um, and then some other stuff, too, to close out the month. So that's basically what's coming up in February and March on the channel, if you assume that I go ahead and publish the stuff from Atlanta that I'm uploading right now. Um, there is the distinct possibility, let's see, this is 2.12, you see where we are on the schedule right now. Next weekend, please note that there is another bye week, I am off next weekend, although I would not completely rule out the possibility that you might not see something from me next Saturday, the 19th. Uh, if I do something at all, it will be very short notice and spur of the moment, and I don't expect anybody to really plan their Saturday around it, but it's something that I could do um, if I felt like it. I wouldn't automatically assume that nothing is happening on the 19th. Because um, I actually have a trip planned next weekend. And I might want to do something around that. So uh, we'll see. We'll see if I decide to do something live on that day. Um, Doug has hinted at it. And, of course, I mentioned it in the bullets of the last slide. But, yes, folks, the big game is only a couple days away as I record this episode. It'll be on Sunday the 13th. 
featuring the football clubs from Cincinnati, Ohio, and the National Football Conference franchise in Los Angeles County, California. Uh, the game will actually be played at SoFi Stadium um, in Inglewood, California, which is across from LAX Airport near downtown LA. Um, the podcast episode that Doug and I are referencing was recorded last weekend, and it's been available on the Gribble Nation Roadcast for the last... I think we published it last Sunday, so it's been out there for several days now. But uh, if you haven't already given it a listen, it's like a road enthusiast... Uh, it's like a Super Bowl preview show geared towards road enthusiasts, where we talk about... Uh, not necessarily the stuff that's going to happen on the field, but we talk about the cities involved, and we talk about the history of their uh, road systems, some of our favorite roads in those cities, some of our favorite landmarks, bridges, uh, and other things that come to mind uh, related to both Cincinnati and Los Angeles. So uh, Doug and Tom were great uh, mystery guests for that episode, and Doug, I think that's one of only two episodes we've done of the podcast so far where um, all four of the main contributors to GribbleNation.org have been audible in the episode. Right. And I know that, uh, you know, when uh, the other thing, too, is when we were, um, when you released the season schedule for uh, season three. I was seeing uh, Kansas City scheduled for this week and thinking to myself, oh, this is going to be a Super Bowl preview as well. <laughs> uh, but um, apparently not. So, Well, it kind of looked like it would be until the second half of the conference, right. conference championship game, right? Yes. Now, I know that you are kind of on the record, at least in the podcast episode, and um, has that link been posted in the live chat? Uh, yes, it has. It has been, okay. Because my live chat is not working very well right now. Um, sometimes it just freezes up on me for whatever reason. Yeah, I see it now. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think you're... We, the three of us who actually did most of the work on that episode, because Adam is a freeloaded bastard, um, you know, he, the, the three of us who were on the record for... Um, our picks for this game. I think, I think there's a strong tug towards Cincinnati in this game. Uh, right, and so. uh, you know what happens with as far as Cincinnati is uh, concerned. I think that they kind of have. They're kind of feel to me it feels like they're kind of like a team of destiny. And the other thing too is, um, I uh, don't think uh, I, mean, I don't really think I have many billionaires, but I really don't think high of the uh, owner of the Rams after what he did with, uh, you know, basically uh, pulling the team out of St. Louis. Yeah, I mean, I have I have mixed feelings about that myself. Um, it was not the most ethical move on his part, but then again, I I have long believed that St. Louis is not a football market. Um, and while the Rams had some traction in the short term, it just long term did not pan out for that part of the country from an NFL standpoint. Um, so, I mean, I, I would be interested to see if St. Louis made a push for another relocated franchise uh, at some point in the future. But for whatever reason, the Rams thing just was not feasible long term. So. I don't know if I really want to blame the Rams for that or if I just want to blame circumstance for that. Um, it's a tough situation, you know. When you buy a team and you want it to be profitable, you got to put it in the best possible place to succeed. And sometimes that involves packing up your bags and going somewhere else. Right. We've seen that time and time again over the years. We've seen it with my favorite NFL franchise. So... I can kind of sympathize a little bit with the ownership groups of these teams some of the time. All right. If you want to know our picks for the game, you're going to have to listen to that podcast episode because we're not going to spend the next hour breaking down the game because we're here to talk about other things. I All want right. to talk about the city of fountains. That's one of the oh, yes of Kansas City. A lot of fountains, statues... Um, 
monuments, memorials. That's a, there's a lot of stuff like that in the city, and that, that's one of the things that I really like about it. You know, this city reminds me of a city that you would find in, like, Ohio, Indiana, Michigan, like in the Great Lakes region. It, it kind of has that vibe to it, and it's stuck right in the middle of the plains. It does not feel like a Great Plains city. If you go to a city like Wichita, um, that's a plain city. Right. And it's plainly obvious when you're driving through it that, okay, we're in the Great Plains here. Well, when you're in Kansas City, you yeah, geographically you're in the middle of the plains, but it feels like an Ohio, Michigan-like city. Like in the Midwest somewhere, right? I don't know if you've been to Omaha, but you know, Omaha kind of has a similar feel to Kansas City. Yeah, I've not been to Omaha either, but yeah, I, I have heard that. Um, so yeah, that 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 is one thing that I was pleasantly surprised about when I was exploring KC last year was how much it felt like the Midwest and not like the Great Plains or the West. Um, the city's population, well, we're going to break this out into both the Missouri and Kansas municipalities for you. I have that on the screen here. Uh, Kansas City, Missouri is the largest municipality in, in Missouri. Po city population is just over half a million. The entire bi-state metro area is a little over two million. Of course, this metro area is situated at the Kansas-Missouri border. It's also at the confluence of the Kansas and Missouri rivers. Um, the land around Kansas City uh, was purchased in 1836 as part of the Platt Purchase, as part of the western expansion of the state of Missouri, uh, all the way westward to the Missouri River. Um, over the years, the city grew quite quickly as an industrial and railroad hub, um, it's still very much a, a crucial link in the national railroad system today. Uh, if you go, say, just west of downtown or across the Kansas River into Kansas, you will still see miles upon miles of railroad yards and railroad terminals, um, all sorts of stuff related to freight rail traffic. All right, and even uh, you know, in the Kansas City uh, metro area over in Independence, Missouri, that was the starting point of a number of the historic uh, pioneer trails, the Oregon Trail, the California Trail, and the Santa Fe Trail. Yeah, so this was really a hub for transportation going back even to you know the pre-Civil War days. Right. Um, and it was part of that critical you know, hub in, in the transportation realm that uh, allowed it to grow as quickly and as large as it did um, to become a world-class city. And, of course, we know about the nickname City of Fountains because of its numerous water fountains. Well, one of the, th one of the other nicknames it has is Paris of the Plains, and that's because of its large concentration of urban boulevards, uh, tree-lined avenues, and also, again, the, the concentration of memorials and monuments and museums that, you know, dot the landscape within the city itself. One of the most notable of these, and of course there are a lot of them that we could list out, is the National World War I Memorial and Museum, which is located on a bluff uh, just south of downtown. Um, that has been here in Kansas City since 1926, the centerpiece of the, uh, the memorial and museum is what's called the Liberty Memorial. It's a 250-foot uh, tower standing above the skyline. Um, and at night, it is illuminated, and there's also a torchlight that glows from its top at night, uh, which I haven't seen in person, but apparently it's a really interesting and unique touch. Other things in KC that you might find interesting from a museum standpoint, uh, the Harry Truman Presidential Library is located out in suburban Independence, Missouri. Um, and also the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum, the National Negro Leagues Baseball All Museum, right. is located in KC as well. I have uh, not been to the Harry uh, Truman Library, but I have been to the Harry uh, Truman uh, National Historic Site, which is also in Independence. 
And uh, that actually was where uh, Harry Truman and his wife um, you know, lived after uh, Truman left the White House. And uh, basically it was – when I went, this was about 10 years ago – uh, you know, basically, they left everything uh, basically the way it was when Bess Truman, which was Harry Truman's wife, when she had passed away. Uh, so basically, everything is, you know, basically, you know, at basically, you know, as it was left, essentially. Mm. Isn't that kind of like what uh, happened with FDR's home? I believe so. I've been, I've been to uh, I've been to his home in Hyde Park. Yeah. Been a uh, <laughs> Martin Van Buren's house in uh, Kinderhook, and actually, he was a uh, gadget guru of his day. Yeah, yeah, I, I live so close to the FDR estate. I really should go back more. But, yeah, uh, that's one of those things that you just never think to go to because it's well, duh, it's right in your backyard. Why would you yeah. rush out to go see it? You know. Um. All right, let's do a really quick crash course on KC Sports. I don't want to spend a half hour on this because we just spent a few minutes talking about the Super Bowl. But for all you NASCAR nuts out there, of course, the Daytona 500 is coming up and the Kansas City metro area is home to Kansas Speedway, which is located on the Kansas side of the metro. It's right across from the western I-70-435 junction out in the Kansas City, Kansas suburbs. At the opposite side at the opposite eastern junction of 70 and 435 in the Missouri side of the metro, you have the Truman Sports Complex, which currently is home to the Kansas City Royals, who play at Kauffman Stadium, and the Kansas City Chiefs, who play at Arrowhead Stadium, literally right across the parking lot. Um, The Royals are the second major league franchise to play their home games in Kansas City. The first was the relocated Philadelphia Athletics in the 1950s, who were known as the Kansas City Athletics for about 10 or 12 years, before they packed up again and moved out to Oakland, California, where they reside today. Um, A very angry uh, Missouri senator named Stuart Symington helped fast-track the expansion of Major League Baseball to include a new Kansas City baseball franchise that was born in, I believe, 1969 as the Kansas City Yes. And also the other team, because you had to expand in pairs, right, in order to keep, you know, from there being from an odd number of franchises. So the Kansas City Royals joined the American League. The other franchise to join Major League Baseball in 1969 was an infamous franchise known as the Seattle Pilots. Right. More on them in a future webinar episode. And the thing about uh, the name Royals, it isn't necessarily pertaining to royalty. It actually is um, a nod to the uh, livestock industry uh, in in Kansas City. There's, usually there's a livestock show in Kansas City called the American Royal. And it's, it was named after, you know, the American Royal uh, Livestock Show mm-hmm. from, like, the stockyard. So. I always wondered if the Royals' name was somehow a nod to the Kansas City Monarchs. Uh, mm, apparently not. It doesn't have anything to do with that? It's a nice coincidence, though. It's actually... Um, you know, some people say it was in regard, some sort of say it was in uh, honor of the uh, Kansas City Monarchs, but they, uh, but it, you know, the person who submitted it uh, basically submitted in recognition of the American Royal uh, Livestock Show. Mm. Well, on the subject of the Kansas City Monarchs, their, their logo is here in the lower left. Uh, they were the most, they were the longest lasting, they were the most successful of the Negro League baseball franchises. I believe they were among the first to be founded in about 1920, and they were among the last to fold in the mid-1960s. Many of the first generation of African-American baseball players who helped integrate Major League Baseball in the 40s and 50s at some time or other passed through Kansas City and played for the Monarchs. Um... Names like Jackie Robinson, I believe Satchel Paige played for them. Um, Buck O'Neill. Um, and Buck O'Neill is being an inducted to, uh, inducted into the Baseball Hall of Fame in July. And it's about damn time. It is. And it's a shame that he didn't get in when he was still with us. Um, 
Yeah, so he's finally getting in. A lot of baseball Hall of Famers in that first generation of African-American major leaguers um, have ties to Kansas City baseball via the Monarchs, not the Kansas City A's or a major league franchise. We'll talk more about Buck O'Neill later on in the show. But uh, the one other thing I wanted to say about the Chiefs, they played their first three seasons. They were the original AFL uh, league team. They played their first three three seasons in Dallas as the Texans. And then they left because they were very upset that the NFL responded with an expansion franchise of their own in the Dallas market. And so seeking to avoid competition with this upstart NFL franchise, the owner of the Texans moved and packed his bags and moved up to Kansas City and rebranded as the Chiefs. By the way, that upstart NFL franchise that wanted to compete with his franchise was some other team called the Dallas Cowboys. Um, The Royals are two-time World Series champions. The Chiefs are two-time Super Bowl champions. Sporting Kansas City... The Major League Soccer franchise is also a two-time MLS Cup winner. Um, There hasn't been a NBA franchise presence in KC since the mid-1980s when the Kansas City Kings played there for about 15 years. Prior to that, they were founded as the Rochester Royals, where they won their one and only NBA championship to date. They also made a quick stop in Cincinnati under the same name before rebranding as the Kansas City Kings in the early 70s. At the end of the 1985 season, they packed up once again and moved out to Sacramento, where they remain today. And as Shaquille O'Neal calls them, they are now the Sacramento Queens. Um, Doug, I know you want to talk some hockey, so why don't you go ahead? Well, the uh, Kansas City uh, Scouts, which are now the New Jersey Devils, they actually played a couple of seasons in Kansas City uh, during the uh, mid-1970s, actually came into the league with the Washington Capitals. Uh, The uh, Kansas City Scouts, they played at Kemper Arena, which um, is, uh, actually, I think it's still around. Uh, but you know the team was originally going to be called the uh, the Mohawks, which basically uh, lending uh, basically lending from Missouri and the and Hawk, as in like the Kansas City Jayhawk or Kansas Jayhawk. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. Yeah. Um, but what uh, what what happened is that the Chicago Blackhawks vetoed that because they felt that the name was similar and also the logo. If you uh, they were able to find an old logo of the Kansas City Mohawks. Looked a lot like the Chicago Blackhawks uh, logo. Oh, so yeah, no bueno. they had to go back to the drawing board, and they uh, wound up uh, landing on the name Scouts, which is actually the name of a uh, statue in Kansas City called the Kansas City Scout Scout statue, which is in Penn Valley Park, south of downtown. Um, And they lasted in Kansas City for a couple of years. They didn't draw well. Uh, They moved to uh, Denver, uh, and they were the Colorado Rockies for about six years, and then they moved to New Jersey and became the uh, New Jersey Devils. And Speaking of the Kansas City Scout, um, I am posting a link. I wrote a blog article about that. And with the Kansas City uh, Scout, actually, it wasn't supposed to be in Kansas City. Um, The statue was, as I said before, in Penn Valley Park, which is a nice uh, park south of uh, downtown. Um, And the Scout statue looks over downtown. It's a 10-foot uh, tall statue, and it was originally cast by uh, sculptor Cyrus Dolan in 1915 uh, for the uh, Panama Pacific Exposition in San Francisco. And uh, Cyrus Dolan, he, a lot of his sculptures were uh, in tribute to Native Americans. Um, so uh, what happened is that you know, the statue won a gold medal at the expo- exposition, and the statue traveled, you know, basically back from San Francisco back towards the East Coast. It had a, it was temporarily installed in Kansas City, and uh, the people in Kansas City loved the statue so much that they actually raised fifteen thousand dollars. And this was, 
about a century ago to purchase a statue, um, including small subscription campaigns with people paying in nickels and dimes to help raise funds. And then once enough funds were raised, the Kansas City Scout was dedicated as a permanent memorial in 1922. Okay. So hundred years ago. Yep. And then the other thing about uh, the Scout is that's also the name of Kansas City's electronic traffic alert system. Call it, and they call their traffic system the Kansas City Scout. Mm-hmm. Coincidence, no doubt. Yes. <laughs> Uh, the pictures that uh, you've been looking at of the scout statue were taken by Doug uh, this past uh, October. October. Yeah. Yep. Because um, silly me, I actually forgot to visit it. But uh, Tisk. I'm glad. <laughs> well, I'm glad you were there to follow up. Um, yeah. I'll, I'll, well, I you know I suspect I'll be back in Kansas City at some point in the not too distant future. So that's something that I'll have to do uh, the next time I'm in town. Yeah. So you've been looking at pictures of stadiums, the sta- the scout statue, some views of the downtown area. A really pleasant uh, downtown, uh, if I may say so myself. I really like this slide as we start to now talk roads here. Um, what you're looking at is a historic aerial picture from the night. I want to say this is like the late 1940s or so. Um, it's definitely after World War II. Um so you're, you're looking north towards the Missouri River, um, and you have downtown down below. Now, you see the red lines that are drawn on this map. That is where the freeway system was ultimately built. And, of course, you can see the ring right in the middle, right around the downtown core. That's the downtown loop, and then you see all the highways that radiate outwards from there. Um, I should mention, before we go any further... That the Kansas City metro area has more limited access highway lane mileage per capita than any other large U.S. metro area. Uh, you probably would not have guessed that. Um, I'm sure a lot of people would guess Los Angeles or maybe Dallas. Um, but no, it's, it's KC. That's the largest, or the most lane mileage per the amount of population that the metro area has. Um, There are a ton of freeways built in the KC area. Um, We would never be able to get to all of them in one presentation. Um, But it's, it's hard to believe that there were still even more freeways that were planned at one time or other. Like you see on this map, for instance. So what we're looking at here, these are the original planning maps from the 1950s when they were finally getting around to drawing the uh, the Kansas City freeway system on paper and deciding what they were going to build and where. And these this was in the years immediately before the interstate system. So you're not going to see interstate routes on here <laughs> necessarily. But you are going to see, you know, dotted lines, freeways that were eventually built and stuff that was eventually not built. Like you can see this map on the right, you can see the downtown loop right in this area here, right to the right of the Kansas River and below the Missouri River. So that's right here. For reference purposes, this map on the left is a southward continuation of the map on the right. So what you're seeing is off the southeast corner of the downtown loop, you're seeing a dotted line for a U.S. 71 freeway that continues on the next map on the left all the way down. Um, and uh, so you're seeing a lot of stuff that's that's planned to be built and ultimately gets built. A couple of freeways that I'd like to call to your attention that ultimately didn't see the light of day, and we'll we'll refresh this later in the show. Um, Missouri Route 735, which was ultimately branded as Interstate 735 in later years, was intended to branch off of the Southeast Freeway, which is nowadays I-70, and form sort of another southerly inner loop bypass of the downtown core uh, to tie in with I-35 at the Kansas-Missouri state line near Penn Valley Park. Um... There also was a freeway plan for US-24, which would have run along a 
major freight railroad corridor across the north and east of Kansas City, radiating out to the east, um, which may or may not have been the originally planned alignment of I-70 across KC Metro. I don't know about that. I haven't I haven't researched it enough to know for sure, but that was a competing uh, east-west freeway alignment. Um there's a lot to dig into with these maps. I mean, if we had two hours just to talk about maps, I mean, we could we could dive into the different proposals. Like, if we go to this next slide, um, this is Kansas City on the Kansas side of the metro. Um, what you're seeing here, this highway that kind of comes down and then makes a bunch of squirrely turns along the Missouri River and then goes back south again, that's what ultimately became I-635. And you'll notice that that highway is labeled as Circumferential Freeway. Um, that was the originally planned western leg of the Kansas City Beltway. They didn't think that they would need another highway further west of that to serve that role uh, in the late 50s. Um, and, of course, you see its originally planned alignment uh, crossing the Missouri River at the Fairfax Bridge on, a, on US-69. As we'll see in a few minutes, that alignment was eventually changed over the years to include a new Missouri River Bridge. But the freeway system around KC Metro gradually took shape over the 60s and 70s. Uh, you see here on the map on the left first, I-435 taking shape in the south and the east of the metro. Um, most of the stuff downtown is in place at this point, with one notable exception being I-670. That was one of the last pieces of the Metro's freeway puzzle to finally come to fruition. Um, also, you see other stuff north of town starting to take shape gradually. I-29 becomes a thing. Uh, US-169 becomes a thing as a freeway. Um... Fast forward another 10 years to the 80s again. Uh, we're still missing 670 um, in the southwest of the downtown core, but we've got a lot of other stuff that's taken shape in the years since then. Uh, we've got I-470 out in Lee Summit taking shape. We've finally got some construction happening on the northern leg of 435 up by the airport and uh, north of Gladstone. And then 670 finally becomes a reality in the early 90s. That's roughly when this map was published. And you can see the freeway system. Um, well, actually, no. This is still showing 670 as a dotted line here. Because 470 is also a dotted line. Um, but yeah, 670 was one of those that was a dotted line for a long time before it finally happened in the early 90s. And in fact, if you look at these maps... Um, showing the downtown core, for instance, you see how the loop itself is largely in place. The western leg of the downtown loop was the last piece of it to be built. And also I-670, obviously, radiating westward from the southwestern corner of the downtown loop. Um, that was a very late addition as well. Um, also, you notice how... US-71, or what's now US-71, radiating southward from the southeast corner of the loop is also a dotted line at this point. But they were not shy about building three quarters of the loop, at least, at least right away, anyway. And here's the system that we have today. Um, as I said, there are a lot of freeway miles, a lot of lane miles in KC. And they managed to build it. They managed to build it all in about 30 years, which is pretty darn impressive. Um, you have you have a full beltway around Kansas City in the form of I-435. You also have other inner bypasses of downtown KC. So, like you have 635, and then you've got um, even 670 and 70 are kind of alternates of e off of each other. Um, there's a lot of redundancy in the KC freeway system, as I'm sure you're, you're picking up on already, which is not typical of a lot of American cities. Um, in a lot of cities' cases, the supplemental freeways that were meant to provide redundancy were the ones that were ultimately canceled by freeway revolts. And we've seen that in a lot of examples of that. Um, in cities across America. But Kansas City is one of the few 
cities where you could say that the redundancy that was planned for the metro area actually did come to fruition. Yep. And I know that, you know, when you look at it, uh, basically it's, you know, with Missouri and Kansas, uh, basically I would imagine that basically because you had two states, they were able to, you know, basically kind of split the funding in a, in a sense too. That's true too. Yeah. Cause you know, KC Metro is the single largest or single most important Metro area in Kansas as well as Missouri. Right. So, you know, there, there definitely was a lot of, uh, infrastructure funding that was certainly funneled in that direction. Um, We've talked about the downtown loop in map form, but I can think of no better way to start our discussion about KC freeways than to talk about the actual loop itself. Um, This is a confluence point of these eight different interstate and U.S. highways. They all come together in the loop and share space in the loop at some point or another. Um... Well, I-29 doesn't. It begins at the northeast corner and then heads north. But the other three interstates do um, actually traverse the loop in some form or another. Um, this is a really interesting drive. And it, it's it's known as the alphabet loop, too. Um, and that's because of its unique exit numbering system, which is made convenient by the fact that the mile post two on Interstate 670, um, 70 in Missouri, 35 in Missouri, they all are roughly around mile post two by the time they pass through the loop. So what they did was they took all of the exits around the downtown loop and numbered them two and then gave them all lettered suffixes. So there are actually 23 different exits off of the downtown loop, ranging from exit 2A in the northwest quadrant to, and then they rotate clockwise around the loop. If you go to this next slide here, I think this will kind of paint the picture a little better for you, but it starts um, at 2A in the northwest, and then the number, then the exit lettering increases clockwise around the loop so that exit 2Y is back in the northwest corner. So you have exit A through H in the north, you have H through, what is it, whatever that is, P in the east, you have P through V in the south, and you have V through Y in the west. It's and the old, yeah. Yeah, it's all a very, it's actually a very well put together numbering system, if you will. Right. And the only letters that aren't used are I, O, and Z, because, you know, I and O look similar to 0 and 1. And then, since there's 23 X's, they actually didn't need Z. That is true. Although I wonder if Z might be used at some point, and I'll explain why that could be in um, a little later in the presentation. There might need to be another exit ramp somewhere. Well, we shall know. see. Plot twist. We'll see. So yeah, this is the this is the best way that I can think of to kind of summarize the route designations and the exit numbering slash lettering of the loop. The loop itself isn't all that long. Like I think it takes you know, I wasn't driving like a Formula One driver when I did it, but I think it took me about five minutes. To do a loop, do a lap around. It's not yet. Yeah, I mean, it's not very long. Um, the thing that often comes up, and I know that Doug, you've mentioned this, is that the exits come up on you so fast. I mean, there's right. 23 exits in a short space of time, short distance. That it's not necessarily that the exits are substandard, although that is a problem in some places. It's just that everything downtown here happens so fast to the driver that you have to really be ready for it well in advance of it happening. You really have to know where you're going right? well before you actually get here. 
And, you know, with that, you know, so basically, especially with, let's say, if you're looking at, I'm not looking at basically the Google Maps, you know, right now, and basically on the northern part, which is where 35 and 70 are, there's a, basically, it seems like there's an exit, like, every few hundred feet almost. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, of course, this was designed and laid out in the early 50s, back before we had interstate standards and all that good stuff. So, you know, it, it was modern, and it worked really well for drivers in 1952. But it sure as heck doesn't really work for 2022, um, which I am perfectly okay with, because as someone who appreciates old freeways and early interstate uh infrastructure i i think the downtown loop in kansas city is a national treasure myself um and long may it continue to live long and prosper and you certainly won't find it anywhere else really not quite the same way as in kansas city no the the kansas city loop is unique um i think a lot of it has to do with the unique exit numbering system but um yeah, there isn't another freeway loop in America that's quite as hectic and yet quite as enjoyable at the same time. <clears throat> now I'm just kind of showing you some maps here of where the loop freeways are with respect to uh, landmarks in the Central Business District and also the Power and Light District um, near the south side of downtown. Kansas City is also known for its um, prevalence of neon signs, neon billboards, and all that stuff. I know that's up at Adam's alley. Right. Um, neon signs, uh, jazz music. I don't think we touched on that earlier. I don't think we did either, but I'll mention quickly while I'm thinking of it that right off of downtown is also the Kaufman Center of the Performing Arts, which is a world-renowned concert hall that is home to... The Kansas City Ballet, Opera, and the Kansas City Symphony Orchestra, which is another symphony orchestra I have to see at some point, because they were not in town when I was out here uh, in early September last year. But uh, these are some pictures of the loop from street grid level. Um, not from freeway level, but from the street grid, uh, looking down, because a lot of this is built below grade. Um, they built a lot of this in a trench and then built overpasses at every city block. Uh, so what you're looking at here, if I can quickly uh, narrate this for you, this is um, this is the uh, south loop looking east in the lower left. In the upper right you have uh, the west loop looking south. On the next slide you have the north loop looking east. You have the east loop looking south. That's what this is. And then you have, on the next slide, you have um, I-670 east approaching the, the southwest corner of the loop there. And then you have, further down the line, you've got the eastern terminus of I-670 at the southeast corner of the loop, where I-70, 35, 29, and US-71 all converge. And then there's another pair of freeway level signage of I-70 west. This is the east loop looking north in the... Uh, in the lower left and then in the upper right you've got um, the northern loop looking west at the 70-35 split at the northwest corner. We will watch a video of a full lap around the loop later on tonight but this kind of gives you a good um, appetizer for exactly what is here and just how crazy some of this real estate can be to navigate. Even on a quiet holiday weekend like this day, it was still not the easiest place in the world to get around. Yeah, and I know that the uh, last time I went through Kansas City was on a Monday afternoon, uh, like right after lunch hour. And uh, I mean, it was easy enough to get through uh, 
like I went across 670 the last time, so that part of the uh, the alphabet loop. But you know, basically, since the ramps are you know come right at you, and the other thing too is there's not a lot of real estate either with some of these uh, ramps. I wound up missing my exit. <laughs> oh, yeah, that that can happen. Yeah, there's no like look at this picture on the left with um, the the ramp for I-70. There's no like exit ramp there you basically are just turning off the highway um and you see that a lot downtown here um every once in a while you'll get a generous exit only lane like the picture on the right uh, these are two pictures of the west loop but um yeah by and large it's just a, a it's a complete free-for-all downtown which is part of why i enjoy it so much i think All right That's your little primer into the downtown loop. Let's see how many of these freeways we can quickly run through here. Now, a lot of these freeways on these slides, are you're going to see mentions of freeway names. Uh, you will not see these highways referred to in KC by their names. Like, there's nobody in suburban Missouri who's going to know what the hell you're talking about when you talk about the North Midtown Freeway. But these are the names of the freeways that were listed on the pre-interstate and early interstate era planning maps. So I've just simply transported them uh, to this slide for your reference. Um... I-29 begins as a concurrency with I-35, leading away from the northeast, northeast corner of the downtown loop. It ultimately ends at the Canadian border, where there's currently an angry mob of Canadian truckers blocking the way. Yeah. I, I think that is one you of the You probably were not there. expecting to say that when you were writing up the slides. I was not, but I made a quick note of it before we went live. Um... So it really was built as a freeway extension of the Paseo, which is a boulevard running north to south across the east side of KC. Um, it involves it involves a bridge over the Missouri River, which we'll talk more about later. It's the Christopher Bond Bridge, which was built in 2010. It's a single tower cable stay bridge, which was a unique uh, engineering uh, feat in its own right. Um, the bridge it replaced was the original Paseo Suspension Bridge, which was built in 1954. It was a four-lane bridge with, I think, a sing with a jersey barrier in the median and no shoulders, and it was completely inadequate for modern travel purposes. And so it was eventually replaced with the bridge we see today in 2010. Um, it also carries a... Once you get onto I-35 northeast of the 29 split, you do see these other logo shields on I-35, and that is the Chicago-Kansas City Expressway, which I've always thought was a bit silly, but it is the designation of a string of roads that connect those two cities. It's primarily I-35 and then... Uh, US 36 up, in Missouri. Yeah, it picks up US 36 for a while, and then it eventually finds its way to Chicago by way of I 88, I think. I 88 and um, I think US 67, I 172, I think. There's a. It, it's more. It goes more more of a roundabout way in Illinois, but in Missouri, it's pretty uh, straightforward. US 36, I 35. Yeah, because I think that the, there's been off and on talk about extending I-72 westward along US-36. And they could probably easily do it. It's uh, I've taken um, US-36, uh, actually took it a couple of years ago, um, driving out to Oregon. And uh, it's quiet, you know, basically there's, you know, they'd have to remove some at-grade intersections, but, you know, they could easily uh, turn it in, into an interstate, basically out, all the way out to St. Joseph if they uh, really want to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, because it does become a freeway even out that way too. Yeah. All right. Um, see on this picture on the lower right, you can see a CKC uh, shield 
on 35 North that carries the designation of Missouri Route 110, which I believe that's the state highway designation for the CKC. Right? Yes, and that's the number that it carries in Illinois as well. Yeah, okay. Because um, you don't see those CKC shields on BGSs in Illinois, I don't think. Um, I certainly don't remember seeing any, so I was a little surprised to see them on BGSs here in the KC metro area. Right. You'll see a lot of basically uh, little like tabs on signs that'll have the uh, uh, the uh, CKC logo in Illinois mm. and Missouri too. Well, you will not, again, see signs for the St. Joseph Freeway, but I think it's a safe assumption to make that I-29 runs to St. Joseph, Missouri, uh, at least based on its freeway title. Um, it runs generally northwesterly out of KC, along the, roughly along the path of the Missouri River as it heads its way towards Nebraska and Iowa. Um, it's also the main way to get you from the downtown loop to Kansas City Airport, so it's pretty significant for that purpose as well. On the subject of Kansas City Airport, um, one of the things that drove me completely mad when I was out there was that people would refer to the airport as KCI and MCI, almost interchangeably, and that is not correct. Um... KCI, I suppose you could say, is short for Kansas City International, but MCI is the proper abbreviation because that is the FAA-recognized abbreviation for the airport. And I believe that goes back to when the airport was built in the 50s and the 60s. It was known as Municipal Airport. Uh, right. It only Actually, later... I have uh, Mid-Continent International Airport. Mid-Continent International. Okay. I did not see that. I will uh, make a note of that. Yeah, so Mid-Continent International. Yeah, so that explains MCI, right? Yes. Yeah. But it's known today as Kansas City International. Um, but, you know, I, I like airports that buck the trend a little bit. So, like, your your name there that you just gave is a good one. Like, Will Rogers World Airport in Oklahoma. Right. And... George Bush Intercontinental Airport in uh, Houston. That's another and, uh, one. Portland, Maine. I think it's the uh, Portland International Jetport. That's yeah. That's another one. Yep. Twenty nine is one of those highways that you know starts off very busy, like, and then you get past I six thirty five or whatever a few miles out, and then traffic really starts to tail off even before you get to the airport because the airport is really out in the countryside. It's not really in the suburban sprawl areas of the metro, which makes it easier for people to get in and out of, I suppose. Right. Imagine, I mean, imagine putting KCI in like Overland Park or something like that. That wouldn't be fun. Yeah. Well, uh, they. Uh, yeah, Overland Park. Yeah, I would imagine. Yeah, it's that would be a lot more convenient, I would think. Mm -hmm. But yeah, certainly, um, it would be a lot. You know, basically, you wouldn't have. They could probably do a lot more. You know real estate wise with uh, the airport where it is if they ever wanted to extend it or what have you yeah that's true there's plenty of room for expansion out there and in fact i think they're working on a terminal expansion idea right now that they just started on that's going to take a few years to be completed but um yeah there's there's no shortage of real estate to expand and build new stuff on out that way anyway so um, I, I expect my next visit to KCI to be significantly different than the one from last year. Um, you will be very smart to point out that I-229 is not in the Kansas City metro area, but I couldn't resist putting it in this slideshow because it's one of those interstates that has a bit of a cult following in the road enthusiast community. That's kind of how I would describe it. It's not really anything all too special, I would say. It is Missouri's 
quietest interstate, in fact, when you look at daily traffic counts. Um, but it has a really special segment through downtown St. Joseph along the Missouri Riverfront that has a double-decker viaduct, which is not very common on the interstate system. And it's kind of randomly placed in a city that you would least expect to find something like this. Um, the 229 freeway came about significantly later on. Uh, this was more of a product of the 1970s when downtown St. Joseph was in significant economic decline and politicians in northwestern Missouri were looking for ways to stimulate development and stimulate interest in the downtown of St. Joe. And so one of the things, the ideas they came up with was building a freeway to directly connect I-29 to the east with the downtown central business district. So I-229 was subsequently born, and to save real estate and to save the expense of right-of-way acquisition, they simply double-decked the freeway along the Missouri Riverfront rather than building a single level that would have been obviously double-wide. Um... The viaduct itself was built in the 70s, and it will be reaching the end of its useful life in the next few years, and Missouri DOT intends to tear it down. And right. the, the likely replacement for it is going to be a tree-lined boulevard. All right. I know that um, yeah, basically looking um, at the maps... Uh, there isn't much, um, you know, as we mentioned, real estate. There isn't much real estate because there is, um, you know, railroads that basically um, are to the east of the uh, viaduct. And, of course, you know, you have the Missouri River right to the west of it. Um, so they, that's, you know, they had basically you can say that they kind of had to uh, put the viaduct within that footprint. Yeah, there wasn't a lot of space to try to shove a freeway in, and they they did the best they could, I think, with the the obstacles that were in front of them. Right. A lot of people in the community will point to projects like this of urban freeway renewal and say that planners have gone mad and that there's no um, there's no reason why this freeway should go away. Um, I frankly think that if there's one freeway that you want to get rid of and can go away without too much adverse consequences, uh, the inner loop in Rochester. Well, well, that, <laughs> we have we've talked about that one too in past shows, I right? Think. Yeah, um, that's one. I would say that you know this is one that we can do without. You know, it's not. As I said, the traffic counts on it don't practically justify its existence. So the traffic that uses 229 can easily be accommodated by a surface boulevard. Um, and if it means that redevelopment of the former industrial areas along the riverfront and the riverfront itself can be redeveloped, then that's a win-win for St. Joe, I think, in the future. Right. Um so that that's kind of my take on it. Obviously, every urban freeway has to be treated on a case by case basis. Uh, so you're never gonna have a solution that fits every single city and every single city's interests. Um, every freeway is built in a unique setting. It carries a unique traffic load, and it serves a unique population. And so when we talk about freeway removals in cities like you know, Rochester and New York and Syracuse, New York, obviously that's a hotbed topic, and cities like St. Joe, Missouri. Um, we need to look at these things on a micro scale and, and examine the impacts locally um, rather than trying to pigeonhole freeway removal into this giant national thing that uh, will have this, the exact same consequences in every single location. Um, I personally think that 229 is expendable. Um, I like the double deck viaduct, don't get me wrong, but at the same time, I also will stand up gladly and say, why do we need this? You know, can we do better with the right of way that we have, and can we recycle the land better uh, to better suit uh, long term growth and prosperity for a, a 
a city like St. Joe that, by the way, is sitting on really good real estate right on the Missouri Riverfront there. Right. Um, that's something that a municipality the size of St. Joe with a population as large as it has should be able to take advantage of. Um, so I am not going to complain one bit if they get rid of the freeway viaduct. I will miss it, but I understand that some things are easier when they are gotten rid of. And also but, too, you know, basically, um, you know, the finances, it takes money to maintain these, uh, these things. So, I mean, you know, Missouri is probably looking at that too. Yeah, it, it's a major expense for Missouri DOT. I, I know that they looked into the cost of replacing the viaduct, and they very quickly determined that that was a non-starter, um, which led them down the path of the boulevard option, which is, I think, where we're ultimately headed. So if you like double-decker freeways, um, get your pictures of this one in the next three to four years or so before construction starts before it's shut down doug i know you've got your pictures of this one already don't you oh the uh, yeah. southeast yeah. freeway i uh yeah. i do yeah. yes well i was talking more about 229 still i yeah. did not i was in uh st joseph but so i took 36 out but then i took 29 north from there so i actually did not go downtown well i'm sure you'll be out that way again maybe on your next uh oregon trip you'll swing by no, possibly. <laughs> uh, but I digress. We're now on to KC Metro and I-70 east of the downtown loop, which was also referred to as the Southeast Freeway on plans. Um, linking the southeast corner of the downtown loop with the eastern suburbs, uh, Independence, and then ultimately out towards the state capital of Jefferson City and St. Louis at the opposite corner of the state. Um, we mentioned this a little while ago, but it's also the primary way to get from downtown to the sports complex, which is where the Royals and the Chiefs have their stadiums, uh, right outside the 435 loop there. Um Watch your speed, yes, that is very good advice on this road, because as you'll see, um, there are multiple sharp 90 degree turns with speed restrictions or speed advisories on them. I believe they're 45 miles an hour in each case. And this is a leftover from the proposed plan to um, build additional freeways off of I-70. Um, you will actually see ghost ramps at each of these uh, curves. They're within about a mile of each other east of downtown. One of them, the northern of the two, which is the one that's pictured here in the upper left, is where the US-24 freeway would have branched off to the east. They built I-70 with these 90 degree turns in them because they thought they were gonna build three level T junctions at each one of them. And you were gonna have um, another freeway branching off to the east in this one, and then at the southern one where there's a sharp turn, um, you're actually going to have a full four-way junction there. You would have had I-735 branch off to the west, and then what they were calling the southeast freeway would have continued south from that point. Um, so they built the geometry of the interstate so that it could easily accommodate new freeways that would tie into the existing freeway that they were building, which of course never happened. And then they never went back and straightened the alignment later. But um, that too is another like early 1950s you know, engineering factor in Kansas City's freeway design. And it makes, makes the freeway system, even outside the downtown loop, out east of town, um, an interesting thing to drive. <clears throat> 35 radiating from the southwest corner of the loop see everything is kind of when you talk about kansas city freeways everything can kind of be talked about in context of the downtown loop and where it is in relation to the loop itself so 35 
here originates in the southwest corner and radiates to the southwest into Kansas, um, serving the main main suburb of Overland Park at the southwest corner of the Kansas City Beltway. It is a major suburban freeway, therefore, that covers ground in two different states. It was built in the Missouri side, in the Kansas City side, um, as a freeway upgrade of the original Southwest Trafficway Boulevard. Once it got into Kansas, it was built on a new freeway alignment that roughly paralleled the Turkey Creek Tributary, which is how it gets its name. Um, one of the things that I suppose we're fortunate about is that the freeway comes up against Penn Valley Park but does not pass through it. Um, the honor of obliterating Penn Valley Park was reserved for the I-735 bypass uh, around the south side of downtown. Uh, but as we know, that freeway never lived to see the light of day. So the Kansas City Scout statue is uh, still preserved for all of us to see. It probably would have been in the median of I-735 had it been built. Well, uh, or would have uh, probably passed right near one of the ramps, I think. Uh, because the uh, statue basically sits uh, basically on the side of a hill. So you might have been able to see it if you're driving on to 735. What it may have done uh, was, because uh, I know right outside of Penn Valley Park, there's a museum called the Money Museum, where you can actually see money. It's where the, uh, it's next, it's over where the Federal Reserve in Kansas City is. And it probably would have obliterated the Money Museum, I guess. <laughs> well. They would have used the money in the money museum to pay for I-735. Yep. <laughs> and the other thing, other couple things I wanted to point out, because um, you mentioned Southwest Traffic Way. Traffic Way is a, uh, like a name of a uh, road that you'll find often around Kansas City and like Topeka. You don't really find that much outside of um, that part of the, uh, that neck of the woods. Uh, yeah, yeah. Traffic way is a unique term in western Missouri and eastern Kansas, yeah. Yep. And uh, another thing that you mentioned, Overland Park, uh, the NCAA used to have their uh, headquarters there before moving it out to Indianapolis. Yes, the good old NCAA, huh? Yep. So, yeah, it would have been the road from Kansas City to uh, College Hoops, I guess. Well, although that's, I guess, in Lawrence. Well, I think, isn't the College Basketball Hall of Fame in Kansas City? I think that's in Indianapolis as well. Is it in Indianapolis? Okay. Oh, no, actually, it is in Kansas City. Aha! Uh Because I think the NCAA, uh, I think they have, they think they have a museum in Indianapolis now, but they call it, they call it the College Basketball Experience. It's in the Power and Light District. Okay. Yeah, I thought I remembered seeing something about that. But, yeah. Okay. Which kind of makes sense, because I know that uh, University of Kansas isn't that far, Lawrence isn't that far away from Kansas City, probably, yeah, 45 minutes or so. And, of course, you know, uh, Kansas is a, uh, you know, one of the uh, college basketball hotbeds. Yeah, that's true. Um, certainly with University of Kansas, and then in more recent years with Kansas State and Wichita State. Right. Um, been a lot of good teams to come out of Kansas over the over yes. last 20 years. The corridor radiating from the southeast corner of the downtown loop and heading generally southward um, to a rendezvous point with Interstate 49 is known as Bruce Watkins Memorial Drive. And Bruce Watkins was a political activist in the Kansas City metro area. He was also the first African-American elected to the Kansas City City Council. Um, this freeway is very noteworthy for three reasons, and they are each traffic lights. There is a stretch about, well, they're not consecutive. So there's three different intersections in South Kansas City. 
that come to signalized intersections that interrupt the flow of the freeway. Um, it was obviously intended that these traffic lights would be removed. And if we go to this next slide, you'll see one of these signalized intersections in the upper left. In fact, there's a wide median between the north and southbound roadways through where these signals are that preserves right of way to build a flyover or a bypass of the uh, signals themselves. Well, that, that's not going to happen, though, because um, the neighborhoods around the planned expansion of the freeway system successfully sought an injunction against Missouri DOT's plan to uh, eliminate the traffic signals. And the uh, freeway bypass plans were blocked by a court order, which now prevents any construction along the right-of-way to improve the signalized intersections with freeway-grade bypasses. So, good luck getting rid of these signals anytime soon. And that probably... Uh... Yeah, basically is the reason why uh, I-49 ends at I-435 instead of downtown Kansas City. Yeah, I would say that there's, because of this, there's approximately negative 70% chance that I-49 will ever reach downtown KC. Right. Um, hey, speaking of I-49, um, so I-49 is actually a relatively new interstate in Missouri. Um, you may have known it historically as belonging solely to Louisiana between Lafayette and Shreveport. However, in recent years, there was a big move and a big petition to have a northern Louisiana to Missouri interstate uh, be basically an extension of I-49 northward. Um, we'll talk about the Missouri section of this for now um it connects the kc metro with the city of joplin in the far southwest of the state and northwestern arkansas in october 2021 the last section of i-49 in missouri was completed uh right around the arkansas state line at uh what the hell's the name of that town bell vista yes yeah, bella vista yeah and i think they think they just opened that too. Yeah, it was it was just opened a couple months ago, I think. So that bypass is now open. So the remaining pieces of I-49 to be built between Kansas City and Lafayette, Louisiana, are all, with the exception of a few miles in Texas, it's all within Arkansas. So now it's Arkansas's problem. Yep. I know that I-49, basically, it's, uh, you know, it's... They have it built down at Fort Smith, Arkansas I-40. So they have, you know, a good chunk of it. So basically, but yeah, the part that they need to build in Arkansas basically goes, you know, basically through the mountains. Mm -hmm. um, so that's going to be a bit of a challenge. Yeah, I think there's a, there's a pretty good reason why that 150-mile gap exists. I think it's about that. Something like that, basically, uh, between uh, Fort Smith and Texarkana. Yep. So. But, you know, it, it's very impressive that Missouri got their act together and upgraded uh, US-71 to interstate standard and the amount of speed that they did. That's how much they can do about the section of Bruce Watkins Drive that's got traffic lights on it, but All right. at, least they've, at least they've got it terminating at another interstate at this point in the metro. Right, um, then you can figure it out. Basically, if you're taking 49, you can figure out where you need to go from there. So, Yeah, that's right. Kind of like I-22, how that ends out in Memphis. Right. Like, it ends at another interstate, right? It ends at 269, but from there you can kind of get to memphis pretty easily so that's another example of a 2di that ends at a 3di within reasonable distance of a city center right um we're spending some time now in the southeast 
of Kansas City Metro. So we talked about I-49, we talked about US-71. We're going to talk about 435 in a little bit, but let's talk about 470 really quick. This is another freeway in the southeast of the Metro. Um, all of these roads come together at an interchange known as the Grandview Triangle. Um, and I'm going to skip ahead a couple of slides so I can show you the visual on this. The Grandview Triangle, when you look at it from an aerial map like this, it basically looks like a double triangle that's attached um, at its center. Uh, it actually used to be a lot more hectic than this. It was recently rebuilt um, in the last 10 years or 15 years, something like that. The original layout here did not allow for separate roadways between the different roads. So all of these lanes at each end of the triangle converged into one and you had to weave across all the different lanes to try to get to the different highways that you were trying to get to. With the reconstructed configuration, now there are dedicated roadways for each different ramp movement. Um, it makes for a lot more um, in terms of overpasses and flyovers, but um, it's much better at, at easily distributing traffic to where it needs to go between all the major highways. Yeah, I've listed out the, uh, the different major highways that converge here at the Triangle, which is at the southeastern corner of the 435 Beltway. Um, 470 itself is kind of like an extension of the Beltway in some respects. It's kind of, it's one of those highways that when they were planning the Beltway, it was thought that they, that 435 was actually going to go out all the way to Lee Summit before turning north. And then they made the decision to have it turn north much closer to downtown. So the people out in Lee Summit and Independence got very upset, so they wanted a connection to the interstate system, and that's kind of how the idea for 470 got started. Um, and I'll have a word on that also in a second, but I want to talk about Lee Summit here really quick. So Lee Summit is one of the larger suburbs in the southeast of the KC Metro. Um... It was officially named in 1868. Now, there's no, it's never been officially established what, who Lee is. Like, what is Lee's summit named for? Um, can most people tend to think that it's named for a gentleman near, named Dr. Pleasant John Graves Lee, whose last name is spelled L E A? Uh, it's believed that the town's name was misspelled on a train timetable in the late 1860s in the form you see it right now, and it just stuck. And so it's been misspelled for 150-something years or whatever, and that's just kind of how it ended up being. There's also a contingent of people who believe that the Lee in Lee Summit is actually Robert E. Lee of, the, of Civil War fame and infamy. Um, and the reason for this is because around the late 1860s, a lot of former Confederate refugees from Texas, Louisiana, and Arkansas moved north into this area and settled in the area that became known as Lee Summit. And so there is a contingent of people who think that the Lee in Lee Summit is actually Robert E. Lee. But again, it's never been officially established who Lee is in Lee Summit. And it continues to be a mystery to this day. <clears throat> but when you look at a map of Kansas City's beltways, you kind of have multiple beltways wrapped into each other and wrapped around each other. Because you have the 435 loop, the eastern leg of 435, and the I-635 west of town are about equidistant from the downtown loop on an east-west axis. Furthermore, the east end of I-470 and the western leg of 435 in Kansas are both equidistant from the downtown loop. So in a way, you kind of have a double beltway that's kind of enveloped within itself. Um, 
kind of an interesting little geographical coincidence there. But that, that does show that when they were planning 435 originally, they thought that it would go that far east before wrapping back around the east side of the metro near Lee Summit and Independence. <clears throat> and we talked about 635. I teased it here uh, a minute ago, but here is 635. It's a useful bypass if you're closer into Kansas City itself and you're looking to kind of skirt around the north corner of the downtown loop between I-35, 70, and 29 there on that, on that axis west of town. Serves some of the closer suburbs of KC Metro. Um, when we were going through the maps earlier, you know that I mentioned that there was a plan that the, that what the highway that became 635 was originally labeled as the circumferential highway west leg and of course this was in the days before they thought that 435 would be a full beltway um they were originally concerned with just building the southern and the eastern quadrants and then as the population started to fill in particularly on the kansas side they started to think about building it as a full uh, loop highway but in the early days of planning of this uh, freeway system in KC, uh, it was thought that 635 would be sufficient to serve as a western bypass of downtown. And as it stands today, it's actually one of multiple bypasses of downtown to the west. So the original alignment of 635 at the Missouri River involved it turning east and then back north across the U.S. 69 Missouri River Bridge um, at Fairfax. But it was decided after some back and forth that a new Missouri River Bridge crossing was ultimately needed, and so 635's alignment was shifted to the west on a new alignment that involved a new bridge on the Missouri River. In fact, there is a short segment of freeway that runs east to west in the north of Kansas City, Kansas, that is signed as Route K5. That was built as the original alignment of what became I-635. It was not until much later that that alignment was abandoned in favor of the, the alignment that we see today. But the K5 freeway segment that was built long before 635 existed remains in place today as more of like a local traffic feeder route. <clears throat> Doug, are you still with us? I am. Well, why don't you talk about 435 for a minute while I take a quick voice break? Okay, so for uh, I-435, it's the Kansas City Beltway, which I believe is one of the uh, longest uh, beltways in the... Uh, I think it's long, one of the longest beltways in the country, actually. I'm just going to double-check that for sure. As uh, Dan was mentioning, it is uh, basically they built the eastern and southern parts of it first uh, because it was uh, that was where the development was. And uh, basically as Kansas, you know, uh, the Kansas side became a little bit uh, bigger, they uh, did that. So basically, it's uh, 83 miles long, and it actually intersects with nearly every other interstate highway in Kansas City, uh, the Kansas City metro area, except for I-635 and I-670. Um, it was uh, built piece by piece. They started building it in, 19, in the 1960s, and then they finally finished it in 1987. Um, so the first part that they built was actually on the Kansas side. Uh, basically, uh, they built it between I-35 and US-69 uh, over in Overland Park, and that was opened in 1965. And then a, a second segment was opened the same year uh, between I-70 and, uh, and US-50 in uh, Kansas City, but the uh, two sec uh, segments were not connected. And... You know, little by little, as I was mentioning, they had uh, started to uh, build the uh, I-435. Uh, uh, by 1965, the, uh, by, sorry, by 1969, rather, 
uh, I-435 was actually uh, built between the uh, two segments. It actually did connect it by that point, um, basically through the southern and eastern parts of the Kansas City metro. And then it was extended, you know, on the east side north, um, you know, later, uh, basically up to US-24, and then they extended up to uh, I-35 in uh, Claycomo, which is the... Uh, it's in the northeast suburbs or northern suburbs. It's over uh, near the uh, Worlds of Fun and Oceans of Fun. I guess they are, uh, you know, theme parks. Um, and then uh, after that, you know, basically by that point it was built about halfway around the city. And then they started building the rest of the 1980s, you know, basically near the uh, uh, KCI airport. And then they start building the uh, western part of the city, and then uh, basically, or what's metro area rather. And then finally, 1987. That's when I-35 was opened all the way around. A uh, couple of other things that you'll notice uh, around uh, I-435: the uh, Kansas uh, Speedway is on the uh, basically where I-70 and I-435 meet in. The uh, Kansas City, uh, sorry, the Kansas City, uh, Kansas part of uh, the metro area. Um, so if you, you know, like NASCAR, um, you know, that's, you know, where you can um, go find the speedway. Um, other than that, uh, I-435 is it for, you know, basically, you know, Overland Park, Lee Summit area, um, and not Lee Summit, but uh, basically um, the southern part of uh, Kansas City area, and then you know basically you can do a whole loop around. Um, it is, uh, I think, it is for it is one of the yes, it is one of the largest. Right after you know, the second long, it is the second longest Beltway. Um, the longest one is I two seventy five in uh, the Cincinnati area. Um, so that is, uh, you know, your uh, little take on I-435 on that. I'm just tr And then if you're looking at other beltways that are longer, you have uh, Beltway 8 in Houston, which is at 88 miles, uh, 88 miles in length. I almost said 88 miles per hour. Um, <laughs> this isn't quite back to the future. Um, and then, of course, you know, in uh, Europe and... Uh, China, they have longer beltways like the M25 in London, but you know, in but the uh, most of it is in uh, 535. The majority is in Missouri, 52.8 miles, and then the other uh, 30 miles or so is in Kansas. On that, so that is I30 I435 in a nutshell. Uh, basically, as it's a it is. You know, basically, you know, it says for it's going to catch a lot of the uh, freeways in the area. So as far as where the north end of I-49 is. Um, also, you have some of the other freeways in the area that are not necessarily part of the interstate system, like in over in Kansas, uh, K-10, which actually goes out to Lawrence, Kansas. Its eastern end is at I-435. Um, and then in Missouri, um, you'll also find another route, and I think uh, Dan will be touching up on this later, uh, um, 152, which is a kind of like an east-west route in north suburbs of Kansas City. So uh, you have that connection. And then, and then um, you know, they have a road out towards Lee Summit, which is Missouri Route uh, 350, which I don't believe is a freeway. It looks like it might be more of a boulevard slash parkway. It looks like there's a number of things going on with that. Um, that actually goes out towards Lee Summit, you know, basically in Raytown, uh, Missouri, mm. on there. Um, and the uh, Sam, uh, I was seeing the uh, Sam Houston uh, Tollway. Um, you know, that is, I believe, longer, uh, but I-275, of course, I was mentioning, is the longest 
interstate beltway and uh, the kansas city beltway for i-35 is it's just a hair under that i think it's actually just under a, under a mile shorter um on that so that is you know what i'm showing on that and uh just see what else is there about i uh 35 uh i-435 that i am seeing oh and now I'm as I'm looking at one, my notes, and now I'm realizing that Dan has a slide open for the Kansas uh, Turnpike. <laughs> uh, and is Dan back? Uh, I, yeah, I'm back. You know, I, I've been enjoying a few sips of this uh, Raging Bitch Belgian IPA while you've been talking. So, mm, I didn't uh, even know you were back. Uh, then, I'm, like, they look, then looking over at my TV, because I have two uh, screens open, I'm like, Oh, um, there's another slide, <laughs> slide up, and <laughs> yeah. I and that was after I was running out of things to talk about. I four thirty five. I I must have read your mind. Okay. Um. Well, do you want to talk about the Kansas Turnpike? Because you're on a roll right now. Uh, I think I'll drink my water. Okay. Um. Well, allow me. Um. Known as the Main Street of Kansas. The Kansas Turnpike was conceived and built in the early to mid-50s and the years prior to the interstate highway system. Um, it is the main highway that gets you from Kansas City Metro to Topeka, where the Kansas State Capitol is, and then ultimately down to Wichita, which actually is the single largest municipal air, municipality in the state of Kansas. Uh, and then the turnpike eventually then turns again to the south to link up with uh, northern Oklahoma. But uh, the turnpike was built, again, at the, at, in the years prior to, I guess, what we would call modern design by 21st century standards. Um, it is a pretty pleasant experience to drive. I mean, it gets, a, it gets pretty boring between Wichita and Topeka, uh, especially that 335 segment between Emporia and Topeka can be really rough. Um, but, you know, you see the general, you know, 1940s, 1950s turnpike engineering that you see in the eastern states uh, replicated still uh, on the Kansas turnpike for the most part. Um, as I said, it is a toll road. Um it recently got express toll lanes at some of its toll plazas, particularly at the southern terminal and the eastern terminal. Also at the I-70 interchange in Topeka has high-speed K-tag lanes. K-tag is the toll tag issued by the state of Kansas. That is also compatible in the states of Oklahoma and Texas. Those three states have formed a, uh, a unified front as far as toll tag acceptance is concerned. Um, the Kansas Turnpike is slated to go to all electronic toll collection by the year 2024. Yep, uh, so, uh, if you, uh, want to, if you like collecting, uh, paper toll tickets, uh, get them all you can. Yeah, I made sure to grab a couple and then, uh, Steve Alps, uh, stole one of them from me. I have a, uh, picture of one from, uh, <laughs> one of the times I've taken, uh, the Kansas Turnpike between, uh, Topeka and Kansas City. I have not been on it south of Topeka. Yeah, I mean, I guess if you want to clinch I-335, then it's worth doing it, but, I mean, the 335 section is really problematic because it's over 50 miles long and there's exactly one interchange between the two termini. So it is a rough drive. If <laughs> it's not a drive you want to go on if you're expecting to see a lot of stuff. That's interesting. Um, so yeah, the electronic toll collection stuff, that's going to happen in the next couple of years. They've actually been opening K-Tag only exit and entrance ramps down in Wichita uh, the, the past year or two. I guess in anticipation of this. Kind of like what uh, Pennsylvania Turnpike has done in a few places. Yeah, yeah, that's true too. Um, so the the Turnpike system that exists today was not the only was not the only part of the system that was planned. There were other spur highways that were built, or that sorry that were planned to be built off of the main line uh, Turnpike between Topeka and Kansas City. Um, 
There was a spur, for instance, that was planned to originate in Wichita and run northwesterly towards Hayes, Kansas, which is about 100 miles west of Salina. That ultimately didn't get built. There was a spur off of the main line east of Topeka that was to run north to Leavenworth and St. Joseph. Another spur... Um, well, the spur that ultimately got built was what's now called the 18th Street Expressway, which is U.S. Route 69 leading south from I-70 uh, towards I-35. That was built as a Kansas Turnpike Authority venture, and I believe it was a toll road for a short period of time uh, before it was handed back to Kansas DOT. But that was built as a means of connecting the Turnpike mainland my main line with uh, the suburbs of Kansas City um, in the state of Kansas. Um, one other spur that was talked about that I find really interesting was the Kansas Turnpike wanted to directly connect their road with downtown Kansas City, Missouri. And in order to come up with this, they proposed building their own viaduct over the West Bottoms and uh, Kansas City, Kansas, to connect with downtown. Um, sort of as a relief route or an alternate route to the Lewis and Clark Viaduct, or the Inner City Viaduct, as it was known back right. then. Um, this plan was the, easily the most ambitious of all of the KTA's expansion plans, and it never saw the light of day either. However, ultimately, we did get our... Lewis and Clark Viaduct relief route built eventually um, in the form of what's now I-670. Uh, yes, the uh, the U-2 highway. They, yeah, that's right. Yeah, because uh, I know that was meant, we did a uh, podcast uh, you know, last year for the Super Bowl matchup, and one of the things that I had found uh, was that, uh, you know, if you remember the video from the uh, song Last Night on Earth, it was actually, uh, you know, I-670 in Kansas City. Yeah, that, that's actually one of my favorite uh, songs of theirs from that period, believe it or not. Yeah, and I never knew where that was until I, it might have been when you brought it up that I, yeah. that I finally figured it out. Yeah, that's neat. This is a map of the Kansas Turnpike system. The Turnpike itself is highlighted in red. Um, and you can see the other interstates in eastern Kansas that kind of intersect it and the other significant cities along the way that you'll encounter. Um, there are four different interstate highways that make up the Kansas Turnpike at some point or another, um, and they're all listed here on the left of your screen. <clears throat> and, uh, oh yeah, pictures. Um... Yeah, like I said, I mean, this road has been modernized and it's been widened over the years, but it still retains a lot of its, you know, original, uh, like, 1950s turnpike geometry and infrastructure and stuff like that. I mean, with the exception of, like, the, the high-speed K-tag plazas and stuff like that, um, much of this road is still original to its its initial construction in the 50s. Um, once you get out of Kansas City and you head towards the west, like towards Lawrence, um, the road does narrow back down to two lanes per direction. Um, so it, it, it does quickly, you know, revert back to a rural uh, highway that doesn't see a ton of traffic a lot of the time. But one of the things that I was surprised to see was that when you get out of KC on the turnpike and you head west, you start to see uh, distance signage for Denver, Colorado. Yeah. Which I think is about 500 miles to the west. At least. Because uh, I know, I would say probably about closer to 600. Because uh, I know that, you know, basically once you get off of. Uh, the Turnpike in Topeka, it's something like 365 miles. And then once you get into Colorado, it's a good, close to 200, it's about 200 miles uh, from the state line out to Denver. Yeah, I know. Once you get to eastern Colorado, you still have like two or three hours to go. And it's pretty flat until you get past, you know, pretty close to Denver. Yeah, I've heard that eastern Colorado is 
pretty intolerable to try to cross. Just because it, it, it reminds, it's, like when people think of Colorado, they think of the mountains, but the eastern third of Colorado is as is just like Nebraska and western Kansas. Yeah, and I'd, and I'd even argue that uh, Kansas is actually a little bit more interesting than eastern Colorado. Yeah, no, I can see that. Um, but yeah, I, I thought it was cool how I would get out of Kansas City and you'd see signs for like, oh, Topeka is this many miles and Salina is this many miles and Denver is 500 and whatever miles, you know. Um, yeah, it's not that far. I can do that in eight hours. That's no big deal. I am going to have to fill in that gap in I-70, though, if I want to, if I want yeah. to punch I-70. Um, I'm not looking I, forward to that western Kansas, eastern Colorado part, I can tell you that. I've done that, uh, I've done that enough times, uh, not too many times, but enough times, but, uh, the only part of I-70 that I need is, like, west of Salina, Utah. So yes, I wound up taking, yes, wound right. up taking 50, uh, instead of dipping down a co-fort. Okay, yeah, so you're not even missing that much. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Well, I survived I-70 across, like, Indiana and Illinois, so I suppose I can survive, you know, western Kansas, too. I found that uh, 70 across western Kansas was more enjoyable than 70 in Indiana. <laughs> it's, flat, it's, it's flat and... Uh, Boring as it is, it's it's easier to drive. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I've i heard that Western Kansas is a lot more interesting than people give it credit for. So that, I'm, yeah. I'm, not, uh, I'm not opposed to checking out that area at some point. Well, we didn't really want to profile everything to a T in Kansas City, but I, what I've got on the screen here are some freeway honorable mentions that you might want to check out more on your own and explore. Um, 152, and I could run through these really quick, but there are short freeway segments along Missouri Routes 210. Um, 759 is a state highway up in St. Joseph. Uh, which is the also known as the Stockyard Expressway, which runs. It's not really a limited access highway, but it it runs through the old St. Joseph Livestock Yards, um, south of downtown. Um, there's a short section of freeway on Missouri Route Nine, um, the K5 freeway section. I mentioned that before when we were talking about I-635. That's a little spur off of 635. That was actually the original I-635 mainline that was wrapping around the north side of Kansas City, Kansas, uh, before the interstate itself was rerouted to a new Missouri River bridge. But that's still there. Uh, the K-10 freeway between um, Overland Park and Lawrence is a good shunpiking route to the Kansas Turnpike if you're heading out that way to the west. Um... I mentioned 210 already. US 69 has two f freeway segments that are noteworthy. One of them runs southward from I-35 uh, through Overland Park. Um, there's actually a plan to build express toll lanes along that section of freeway uh, at hmm. some point in the next few years. So I think those would be the first express toll lanes in KC Metro. Um... And then the other section of freeway that's notable is the section I alluded to before, which is the 18th Street Expressway. That is the spur that was built southward from the Kansas Turnpike I-70 mainline uh, to intersect I-35 in the suburbs of Kansas City, southwest of downtown. And I'd like to throw in an uh, extra couple of mentions as well. On the uh, Kansas side, you also have... Uh, K7, which is, you know, looks like it's a freeway for a, a large chunk of it from uh, I-70 down towards Olathe, which is around where it would meet with I-35. Uh, it actually, that's actually where, it actually it ends before I-35. It actually ends, the freeway ends in Olathe, uh, basically kind of like west of downtown. On the Missouri side, and I do see that this was mentioned in chat as well, uh, that uh, Missouri uh, 291, which is kind of a, in a sense, an extension of I-470. 
Um, I don't know if I-470 was planned to be extended or not, uh, you know, north of I-70, but I too, but uh, Missouri 291 kind of follows, you know, what could have been a northern extension of I-470 in spirit anyway, so... Yeah, it kind of continues the northerly trajectory of 470 at the end there. and it, it, it can kind of be seen as an outer beltway of Kansas City, at least in that part of the metro. Right. <clears throat> um, we'll mention US-169 again when we talk about the Buck O'Neill Bridge, but uh, that's a really interesting freeway, too, that starts way up in the northern end of the suburbs. Uh, east of KC Airport, and then runs southward, uh, intersecting 435, uh, 152, um, I-29, before ending on a freeway that passes right through the downtown airport and then crosses the Buck O'Neill Bridge into downtown KC. Very interesting freeway um, that really doesn't get a whole lot of attention, but it's I liked it myself. I thought it was a great drive, and it's a great view of downtown if you're driving it southbound. So it's definitely worth uh, checking out. Hey, it's Mr. Angry. Yeah, he's back. Um, and he is very angry that even though Kansas City has the most limited access highway lane mileage per capita in the United States, that there were still other freeways that still were not built, and he's angry about that even in spite of Kansas City's abundance of freeways. Um, so again, just a, a quick refresher here before we get on to other bigger and brighter things. So we're looking at the, the downtown loop up, up in this map here that I showed you earlier. I would say the most prominent unbuilt freeway that people talk about is I-735, which was this highway that I'm going to highlight down here. Um, there were other freeways too, like another freeway along US-24, a southerly extension of what was then called the Southeast Freeway. Um, and then, of course, we know about the traffic signals on Bruce Watkins Drive. We know about... Um, you know, other stuff as well. So by and large, like the, the stuff that was planned for Kansas city, the major stuff got built with the, with maybe one or two exceptions, but the, the, the freeway system that was planned in the fifties that was mapped out ahead of time, um, it all more or less saw the light of day, which again is rare for a city as large as KC. You know, and again, I'll, I'll, I didn't do this the last time we had this slide up. This is um, what you're seeing here. If I highlight it in purple, this is um, this is the planned alignment of I-635 that I'm highlighting in purple. You have the original location of the US-69 bridge on the Missouri River, and what ultimately happened was they built an alignment that was more like this that kind of just cut across the river like that um on a new alignment so there's a new bridge there that wasn't there before but uh the other this other dotted line here was ultimately built as the k5 freeway so that's what that is and then the us-69 bridge was retained the old fairfax trust bridges were replaced about 10 years ago i think um and the bridge that crosses there now is nowhere near as interesting, but um, that may have been a big part of why they rerouted 635 is because they didn't want to add more traffic and completely overload the US-69 truss bridges on the Missouri River, which were interesting bridges when they were still with us, but uh, they were, as I said, replaced. <clears throat> And again, we have the system of freeways today, which I think we are quite familiar with. Um, 
think we covered pretty much everything there was to cover road wise. Yeah, Boston. I'd say so. You want to talk about bridges real quick? Yeah, sure. Why not? <laughs> um, so I picked out a selection here. Um, we're not going to go systematically down the Kansas and Missouri rivers here, but what we're going to do is go through what I think are the greatest hits of Kansas city. The ones that I think are the most worthy of, um, coverage and the most worthy of discussion. Um, obviously there are many more bridges in the Metro area than just these ones here, but I think that, uh, this will serve as a good starting point for, uh, for you guys, uh, to, look into and hopefully if you like these then maybe you'll want to check out more of the ones that are in the kc metro area but let's start with these and we're going to start not in kansas city but in nearby atchison kansas with uh the amelia Earhart bridge which was named for the famous uh woman pilot from way back in the 1930s yes uh atchison is also noteworthy as her birthplace which is why this bridge bears her name uh the bridge that stands today was built in 2012 it replaced a, an older truss bridge that dated back to 1938 i do like the color of this arch uh the light blue it's a similar color to um you know, Doug, you did your Newburyport, Massachusetts meeting. Yeah, the Whittier Bridge. Yeah, it looks a lot like the Whittier Bridge, doesn't it? Yeah, I'd say so. Yeah. Oh, and uh, speaking of uh, Amelia Earhart, I believe you can, I would say you can actually see her, um, you know, see the bridge from her birthplace museum. They have, um, because it looks like that's pretty close to the river. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the museum is on a bluff that overlooks the river there. <clears throat> now the inner city viaduct was it might still be depending on how you classify it the oldest bridge on the interstate highway system um the original viaduct was built in 1907 it was open to a mix of automobile and streetcar traffic the streetcar lines were ultimately removed uh to make way for more vehicle lanes um the viaduct, the original viaduct now carries eastbound traffic. The 1962 built westbound bridge was replaced in 2020 and 2021 with the bridge that we have today. Um, and there's talk of a construction project starting up in the next year that will replace the original 1907 structure. Uh, that that will require a full shutdown of I-70 eastbound. Now I-70 westbound had been closed for about two years while the uh, the westbound structure was replaced. The reason they can get away with this is because they simply route all westbound traffic on 70 to I-670. This, which is why having redundant redundancy is nice. Yeah, and Kansas City is one of the few cities, as we said, that uh, got the memo and was able to put a lot of redundancy into their freeway system. So um, they can afford to completely shut down a freeway as significant as I-70 for long periods of time as a result. But the new Lewis and Clark eastbound viaduct structure project is set to begin in the next year. It will probably take two years to complete. Um, and once that's done, the entire segment of I-70 will be up to some semblance of modern interstate standard, um, upon its completion. But like I said, I like these old viaducts too. Like, I like the fact that a bridge that was built in 1907 is still a part of a major interstate like I-70. Right. The only, <laughs> uh... You know, the only structure that I could think of that's about that old in the interstate system is the Bulkley Bridge in Hartford, Connecticut, which carries I-84 across the Connecticut River. Yeah, yep. Which I think was built, what, the following year? Um, I believe so. Like, I, uh, I, wrote some, I wrote something on that a while back. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. they were built around the same time, I think. Right. And, of course, you know, they... You know, they expanded and widened that bridge as well. Um, it, uh, you know, the Bulkley Bridge, you know, that would have been opened in, 
October 6th of 1908. Mm -hmm. The 12th Street traffic way does not cross a body of water. It links downtown KC with the section of the city near the Kansas and Missouri River confluence that's known as the West Bottoms, which is where you had a lot of industrial concentration of warehouses, stockyards, railroad yards, stuff like that. But when they were planning the layout of the city, they were smart enough to realize that they needed to locate the central business district on the bluff above the flood-prone Kansas and Missouri River floodplain. Uh, so that's kind of why the downtown is up on the hill and not down by the river confluence, which is where all the industrial development ultimately happened. Um, so the 12th Street Viaduct kind of crosses above all of this industrial development. It was built in 1914. It's a really impressive double-level uh, reinforced concrete bridge. Uh, its center arch span is visible in this picture on the left. It's a really interesting uh, design. Um, the bridge looks pretty good for being over 100 years old, I have to say. Um, certainly when you compare this bridge to its cousins in, say, cities like Pittsburgh and Cincinnati, uh, I would say this bridge is doing pretty well for its age. Um, here you have a picture of the lower level in the in the picture on the right and also I like this angle too from street level looking again looking eastward towards uh, uh, ultimately where downtown is up on the top of the hill there <clears throat> and I think that was also in the uh, music video for Last Night on Earth as well I'd have to go watch the video again. You know, I'm going to have to go watch that video, too, once we're done here. Because I, I think I watched it when uh, you pointed out what freeway it was, and then I haven't watched it since then. i got to go back and see it again. All right. Um, one of the most significant projects coming soon in the Kansas City area is the Buck O'Neill Bridge replacement project, but let's deal with the bridge that exists today first. That one was built in 1956 named for um, prominent Negro League baseball star and future professional baseball Hall of Famer Buck O'Neill. Um, it was known as the Broadway Bridge until 2016 when it was renamed in honor of Buck O'Neill. Uh, so you will still see references to the Broadway Bridge um, on signage or in print media or whatever. And this is the bridge that they're talking about when they say Broadway Bridge. Um, this bridge is ultimately going to be replaced in a project that is already underway. Uh, since these pictures were taken in September of 2021, significant progress has already been made. Um, actually, a good number of the approach piers on the on the downtown side are either built or are being built right now. Um, the project was begun in 2021. It's expected to be complete by the end of 2024. Um, one of the motivations for this project, in addition to replacing a bridge that has pretty much reached the end of its useful life, is that they want to better integrate the US 169 freeway and this bridge into the Kansas City downtown loop freeway grid. So one of the things they're doing is they're actually building a bridge that's kind of got a bit of a Y shape to it. It's got a branch that's got like a spur off of it that will directly connect to the northwest corner of the downtown loop. It's not officially been spe it's it hasn't been officially stated what they're going to do with the exit numbering at this spot. It's possible that they will introduce a new exit 2Z to the mix. It's also possible that they'll just recycle uh, the lettered exits that they have in circulation right now. I can see them doing that because I can see them also making the argument that Z looks too much like 2. Um, so I can see them not going with the letter Z on an exit. I can also see them using letter Z in an exit for this new bridge. Um, 
which I'm frankly a little disappointed in how bland and uninteresting it looks. Um, Especially with all the other uh, interesting-looking bridges in the area. I also uh, posted a link to the uh, Replacement Project uh, website in the chat as well, in case you're interested in finding out a little bit more about the Replacement, as opposed to what we're going to be going over. Yeah, it, it, it it's disappointing that... I mean, I, I suppose it's one of those things where they, they have to replace the bridge, but... Um, Man, they couldn't have come up with something a little more interesting than this. I'm a little disappointed by that. Yeah, so am I. Um, it hasn't been officially stated what the name of the new bridge will be. I think a lot of people are just assuming that it'll be the Buck O'Neill Bridge when it's done. Um, but leave it to any local politician to come up with somebody to name it for. You know, we have experience with that here in New York State. Yeah, we're not going into that for <laughs> you. Don't <laughs> that, want to that, go there. That, that's a, a tinderbox argument. Oh boy. Yeah, that's 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 conversation for the AA Roads chat later tonight. Um, let's talk about the Armor Swift Burlington Railroad Bridge real quick, which was built in 1911. Um, this is a bi-level bridge. It used to actually have a roadway on its upper level. Um, if I go to, yeah, this slide will show it better. Um, you can kind of see how this, the bridge in these slide in these pictures is in its lowered position and you have a lower level f with, that has a single track for freight trains. And then you also have an upper level there that was once occupied by a roadway. Um, so what would happen is that the bridge would... This is not the right sign. Here we go. So the the bridge would lift itself up basically one level so that the lower level would then be at the height of the upper level. And then the upper level would obviously be at the next level up near basically where the, the top of the truss is. Um, you can see all the interesting cabling and counterweight stuff that's integrated into the design of this thing. It's a very intricate uh, lifting mechanism that they have built into this thing. Um... And I have never seen this bridge raised before, but it, and I have no idea if it's still active. I, I, I presume that it can still be moved if necessary. Yeah. Um, the uh, old US-1 bridge over the Kennebec River in uh, Bath, Maine reminds me, you know, of, you know, basically the same type of setup. Yeah, so the ASB bridge carried roadway traffic until the 1980s when it was painfully obvious that the roadway needed to be relocated off of that bridge onto a separate structure, and that's how the Heart of America bridge was born. Uh, it was completed in 1987. It carries the Missouri Route 9 Expressway, um, more or less right next door to the ASB bridge. Um Again, another pretty bland, uninteresting bridge, but it, you know, it, it does its job, I suppose. <clears throat> yeah, I would say, uh, you know, looking at that, the uh, ASB bridge is a lot more interesting, but, you know, basically it's, uh, you know, basically a function over aesthetics, I guess. I think part of the problem is that because you're so near to the downtown airport, um, you're not really free to design any kind of, you know, signature looking superstructure. Um, yeah. Those things cause... have to be approved yeah. by the FAA and all that stuff. So, you know, I'm sure that came into play with the new Buck O'Neill design. You know, it's not. It's one of those things that's. It's weird. Like the the bridge itself is not within a flight path of any kind, but I suppose it's close enough to a flight path where, you know, they they don't want to put a bridge tower where a plane could go off course somehow. You know, it's something like right. that. You know, <clears throat> so I'm I'm sure that's I'm sure that was part of the discussion. Um. Well, one place they were able to put a tall bridge tower was 
a short distance east of the Heart of America Bridge, and that is the Christopher Bond Bridge, uh, which carries Interstates 29 and 35 over the Missouri River. We did talk about this bridge uh, when we were talking about the I-35 freeway, which radiates out from the northeast corner of the downtown loop. I will like to say at this juncture that this bridge is named for the gentleman who was the 47th and 49th governor of Missouri. He served two separate terms um, in the 70s and 80s. He also was U.S. Senator from Missouri from 1987 to 2011. And his name was Bond, Christopher Bond. Or Kit Bond uh, is uh, another name for him. He was actually born over in St. Louis, and uh, his hometown was in Mexico, Missouri, which is towards St. Louis, so I'm not quite sure why they uh, decided to name a bridge for him in Kansas City, but I do know, you know, obviously in the same state, they're like, oh, we'll just pick a bridge. Um, I do know that uh, the uh, New Paseo Bridge, or the uh, Kit Bond Bridge, you know, that was... Uh, opened around the time he uh, retired from the Senate. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, it was more or less as he was finishing up his last uh, term in office, right? Uh, yes. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Well, that's Kansas City for you. Well, it took us quite a while to get to this slide. I know that there's a lot. There was a lot to talk about, but uh... now I want to barbecue. <laughs> yeah, uh, Gates or uh, Arthur? Uh, was it Gates? Uh, is it Arthur Bryant's or Q39? Uh, you know, I can't answer that. I don't know. I don't have experience with uh, a lot of barbecue. Tisk. Yeah. <laughs> You know what the problem is? My stomach really acts up, too. Mm. So, uh, it's very tasty, don't get me wrong, but then I end up paying the price on the back end. Uh, which is unfortunate, of course, but uh, it is what it is. I'd be happy to take your questions in the live chat if you guys have any. Um, again, we're off next Saturday officially from any kind of presentation, but they're... There could be something next Saturday the 19th, although I'm not going to make any promises. Um, the next official presentation that we have will bring us back to the Pacific Northwest and a conversation about the roads and freeways around greater Seattle and Tacoma, Washington. And we hope Another to... city that we were both in at different times last year. Yeah, that's right. We we're kind of we shadowing each other from time to time there yeah. last year. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that'll be the subject of conversation on the 26th and uh, I'm already looking forward to that show we've got a great panel already lined up for that one and uh, we look forward to seeing you for that one <clears throat> well we've See, already been live for what a couple hours <laughs> yeah yeah I need it's a good thing we're doing this show on a Friday night. I need two more days to recover from this one. Uh, and uh, the Islanders have a late game, so after this ga after this is over, I uh, get to watch the Islanders play the Edmonton Oilers. No, they are on the West Coast. Or yeah. Mountain time zone, at least. Yeah. Okay. All right, so you ain't going anywhere anytime soon then, right? Yeah, let's watch some videos first. Okay. <laughs> good idea. Um, okay, let's... Um... Let me see what I can dial up here. I promised you guys laps around the downtown loop, which I suppose is the best way to start any real discussion about uh, the Kansas City freeway system. Um, this was one of those like marathon videos where I just turned on the recorder and just went for a while. Um, so you're getting a lot of the Kansas side of the of the metro here, and at least at the start of this video. But I really want to include the um, 
the inner city viaduct with part of the experience here of driving the loop itself because you know because inner... it's a classic yeah it, it really is and again it, it's another one of those classics that's going to be going away soon so um you know enjoy it while you can Yeah, you know, that's the thing about like the old roads and and highway signage that I grew up with. So much of that stuff is gone now. Um, yeah, I'm glad I uh, documented a lot of the older signs. For instance, you know, when I uh, had a chance, and again, I've been at this. You know, I would say, you know, I would say, yeah, you know, since the uh, end of uh, since 1999, really, is when I started taking pictures of road of road signs and what have you. Yeah, like you have a lot of pictures of stuff from like the '90s that I remember as a kid. But of course, I'm I'm significantly younger than you are, so I hadn't really right. caught on to the picture stuff yet. But you have pictures in your archives of New York State stuff that I remember vividly seeing as a kid and thought was really fascinating. And you know, to this day, I somewhat lament the fact that I got into picture taking relatively late compared to some of you but um yeah like i'm glad that you have pictures of all the stuff that i would have liked to have documented myself all right and then there's a few things i wish i did get pictures of i do kind of wish i kind of latched onto things a couple years earlier and you know would have gotten a little bit more but you know i do have uh Quite a few extensive uh, things. Kansas City, uh, pictures I have around Kansas City area, though. I would say, you know, with, really within the past 10 years of, you know, whatever pictures I have from the area. So I've been through, uh, been through Kansas City uh, four times over the years, so. Mm. It's one of those crossroads places, right? Like, yeah. Yeah, if you're at, if you're traveling out in this general part of the country, chances are your travels are going to take you through here at some point. Right, especially if you take uh, seventy across, or uh, or if you take uh, seventy west from St. Louis, and you're taking let's say sixty four east of St. Louis, you're still gonna wind up in Kansas City if you're going west. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's at the junction of 70 and 35, so, you know, that naturally is a giant, you know, confluence point for traffic in the Midwest and the Plains. <clears throat> and somehow, I, you know, and it's possible that planners sort of foresaw that and were like, you know, the city is going to become pretty significant in the years ahead because of its strategic location in the interstate system. Um so we better make sure our freeways are up to up to right. stuff, you know. But you notice as we as we take this lap around the loop, you know, we were just on the north loop and we've turned on to the east loop here. You'll see that a lot of the ramps are single lanes and there's not a lot of merge areas. There's no deceleration zones for these ramps. It's really just a giant uh Free for all, more or less. All right. <clears throat> I mean, I've taken, you know, I've done the alphabet loop, but you know, really, if I'm going across Kansas City, I uh, prefer just taking. Uh, if I'm taking seventy across, I prefer just uh, going on six seventy across town. It's a lot easier. Yeah, I mean, it's it's really the de facto seventy now across town. Right. Um, it requires the least amount of movement. As far as changing lanes or or whatnot, you'd basically just stay straight and you you get straight across town. Um, but yeah, it, it uh, and of course it, it's interesting because six seventy was the really the last link in the downtown freeway system, and now it's really the it's now the link in the system that people can't imagine the whole freeway system without. And even see a sign where it says Alt seventy. Yeah, um, I, I suppose that's you know. I don't think the, I don't think commercial. I don't think there are any commercial vehicle restrictions on seventy. Um, 
no. through downtown. Um, I know that was true. Like I'm, I'm remembering like way back before they replaced the inner belt viaduct in Cleveland, how that was how I four ninety was listed as alternate ninety. But that was also because there was a commercial vehicle restriction there, um, which is now out of the picture. So it, that that doesn't really apply anymore. But um, so you're not dealing with the same kind of situation with Alt-70 in this case. But, I mean, they might as well just sign it as 70 because it is the, the quickest way to get you to Kansas from these suburbs. Right. <clears throat> but, you know, they, we, we don't make the rules on that, so. Well, I think that some people in the road enthusiast community wish they did. Oh, of course. <laughs> yeah, we won't get into names here, but some ideas are better than others. No, that's true too. Yeah, I hear you. Um, from our uh, arm, or from our armchair engineers, I guess, and armchair engineers who have a lot of other different professions. Mm-hmm. And other different things that made them famous over the years. I mean, you've talked in your in your blogging and your podcasting about guys like FDR and Robert Moses, who really weren't engineers by trade, but really were engineers by mindset and by right. you know determination to get things built. Um, those are two classic 1930s examples of people like that. And there are other examples of folks like that in modern times, but those are the two that I always think of first. Yeah. Cause, uh, I, mean, I, I did research, you know, once and yeah, basically there was a, uh, highway proposal that FDR just drew up in basically just kind of like put in a piece of paper and try to get it approved of course it never happened because we don't have a parkway to hyde park no <laughs> yeah the uh which i guess would have been called the fdr parkway if i'm not mistaken i don't think you could have had any other name for it yeah but it's so interesting how you know this this road that FDR drew on a piece of paper just sort of offhand actually would have been probably next to I-84 it would have been the second busiest east-west route in all of Dutchess County. Yeah, it would have been it would have been very <laughs> useful. Yeah. As it turns out, yeah. He actually knew what he was doing. Um he knew what he was doing with the Taconic idea. You know, bringing yeah. traffic up the Hudson Valley that way. And then he also knew, he also recognized not just the need for an east-west parkway, but a way to get from the Taconic towards Hyde Park and Poughkeepsie and also the Mid-Hudson Bridge, which he was a part of um, overseeing also. I even had a uh, podcast episode I recently uh, did about that, which I'll link. Why don't you post a link to that, young man? Because that, that's, that's a good episode for people to yeah. listen to. If people want to get familiar with our podcast and what we're doing, I think that's a good episode to kind of break the ice a little bit. Yeah, it's not uh, terribly long. <laughs> yeah, I'm like some episodes. And you get a lot of information and a little personal perspective as well from me. Yeah, it's I mean good... it's the road I rem. Yeah. One of the roads I remember most from growing up because you know I took that road a lot going between Long Island and the Catskills. Yeah. Yeah, it's not too long, unlike some episodes that have come yeah. out recently. You know. Actually, I think I'll be in the, on the Taconic tomorrow. Okay. Well. See, I deal with the Taconic Monday through Friday. So, I don't need to deal with it on the weekends. Yeah. <clears throat> Anyways, back to Kansas City. Oh, yeah, by the way. Uh, so, we did the... Um, we did the loop in the clockwise direction in the first video, and now this is a video in the counterclockwise direction. Um 
again, really, I'm showing you both directions of this to kind of give you an idea of just how big of a cluster this is to try to navigate no matter which direction you're coming from. Um, cause there's a lot that comes at you in a hurry. Like it's not, as I said before, it's not necessarily the actual exits that are the problem. It's the fact that there are so many damn exits that get thrown at you at once that right. it, and everything just merges together at, at the exact same time. And it, it's very difficult to get across traffic and get into the proper lane for whichever highway you're trying to get to. So, um, left exits and what have you. Yeah, like yeah, like this single lane ramps. Yeah, yeah. It's 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 very yeah. As I've said many times in this show, it's it's very reflective of early you know, modern interstate highway design before we got the idea that this stuff probably wasn't the best idea. But in a confined space like the downtown Kansas City area, I'm not sure that you'd be able to do much better than this anyway. So... Right. Anyway. There are a few overpasses on the, um, the Kansas City loop that you get great views from. A couple of them are on the east loop that we just passed underneath. Um, I really liked getting pictures of the north loop that we're turning onto right now. Because um, the overpasses here are a bit more spread apart and you can kind of get more of a vantage point looking down the highway uh, from some of these overpasses. Uh, so I like these. Um, the exit at 12th Street also has a good overpass for photography purposes. The West Loop has a bit more landscaping associated with it, so that's an interesting perspective. The South Loop doesn't really have a lot of good photo photographic opportunities because um, they've put up this really annoying pedestrian fencing on all the overpasses down that way over in the Power and Light District. Um, so it kind of prevents decent photography from happening, but um, you at least have a you at least have your pick of good vantage points uh, from street level and from freeway level in at least three of the four quadrants. Yeah, I don't know why the hell this video is 13 minutes long. It does not need to be half that long. But when I upload this to YouTube, it'll, uh, what do you call it? It'll, um, it'll parse itself out or something like that. Yeah. So when I upload it, I'll upload the file and then I can go into the video editor and then trim down the length. So I can say, you know, I only want, you know, the section of the video between the two minute mark and the nine minute mark to be public. You know, I can mm -hmm. do that kind of thing. So that's probably what I'm going to end up doing. <clears throat> but, um, with the remaining time I have with you guys tonight, I'll show you guys a couple other, uh, freeway segments in the Kansas city area. Um, I'll show you I 70 westbound from the sports complex on in through downtown, um, to approach the, uh, the downtown loop from the east. <clears throat> um, and you can, uh, looks like you can see, uh, the sports complex nearby. Yeah, you to go. your left. Yeah, you go right past center field at Kauffman Stadium on 70. And, um, Arrowhead Stadium is situated a bit further in the background, but, um, yeah. You can catch a better view of it, you know, basically going westbound than eastbound. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, I didn't mind Kauffman Stadium when I went there um, in September. I, I happened to be in town when the Royals had a homestand, so I went there for a game. And um, it's not a bad ballpark. Um, there's some stuff in it that's pretty cheesy and reminds you of like minor league baseball more than major league baseball but um it's an interesting ballpark it's very pretty too with the the fountains out in the outfield um 
And the ambiance and the setting is a very intimate and very friendly kind of atmosphere that um, I certainly didn't mind. You know, for what it is, it's it's a nice it's a nice place to watch a ball right. game. I remember uh, years ago, you know, basically when I was a kid, you know, watching. Uh, you know, my dad was a Yankees fan, and uh, when they would have uh, games, you know, in Kansas City, and you know, seeing the fountains and you know, it looks very. Uh, Nice and landscaped. It, for an older stadium, uh, it's actually, I would say, you know, one of the uh, one of the nicer stadiums around still. So, <clears throat> yeah, I and mean, Kaufman is one of the one of the oldest surviving major league parks, I believe. It was built in the uh, the early seventies. Yeah. Um... It's up there. I think it's it's about the same age as the Oakland Coliseum, you know, and, and places like that. Um, obviously, Fenway in Boston and Wrigley Field in Chicago are the oldest, but um, Kaufman is in top five for oldest parks still. Um, and and they did a and you know what the key is that they did a great job with the renovation a few years ago, where they really went in and kind of gutted a lot of the original stadium infrastructure and just replaced everything and now everything's a lot more open air and a lot more enjoyable and the stuff that they did in the outfield around the fountains um adding more concourses out there adding more restaurants out there um and opening and keeping the fountains as a as a primary uh focal point of the stadium i i think i think the renovation came out great and right um, yeah, that that's how you keep an old ballpark around is that you keep you keep updating it but you keep the the charm that made it popular in the first place. Right, of course, you know, fountains scream Kansas City, so Yeah, you know, it it's funny you mentioned that cuz you know, we we did talk about Kansas City being the city of fountains and so it's perhaps not a coincidence that Kaufman is home to so many water fountains within its confines. <clears throat> we've this is uh want to say this is where uh 735 would have come in that is correct yep yeah that's your first sharp curve um 735 would have just continued straight basically from from that point um and then when you get to the next sharp curve which will be a left hand turn that's where you'll have that's where you would have had another freeway along US-24 branching off to the east um, to complete the T-junction that was planned for that location. There's actually a ramp stub that I didn't even notice when I was going through live. I only noticed it on Google Maps after the fact. It's not. It, it's kind of in a weird location. It'll be off on your left before you get to the curve. But it's basically a single lane wide, and it would have been to serve a ramp that would have connected US-24 westbound with what's now I-70 eastbound. It's kind of got that tend, it's got that bend in it that suggests that it was going to connect the eastbound lanes of 70 with a westbound roadway coming from the east. Right. <clears throat> And then over, uh, you know, where uh, 70 would have been uh, at 735, you can see, you know, where the ramp to 70 West would have come in as well. Yeah. Yep. That's another one. Yeah, so the... Um, As we said, you know, there's so many freeways in Kansas City that were built, yet there were so many more that could have been built, too. You know, the, you know, the freeways that exist today are a large majority of what was planned originally, which, again, is atypical of a lot of metro areas in this country. But um, still, it's quite interesting to see that there was still a lot more that was planned for, for this area. <clears throat> now for those of you who enjoy uh virtual clinches of interstates you know maybe maybe you guys aren't 
able to travel that much. You know, maybe you guys have, you know, maybe some of you watching have toddlers who you want to add to their clinch maps. Well, you can kind of, yeah. you can make a case that this counts as a clinch. Just yep. watching a full video of, uh, you know, I-670 across Kansas City. Yep. Or if you have a weird, adver- or if you have a weird aversion to uh, barbecue and jazz music. <laughs> yeah. Well, I you know I don't I don't mind either of those. You know, I can get into a good jazz concert. If yeah. You, if you turn something on. <clears throat> in fact, I'm going to a concert in the city a couple weeks from now that uh, is being held in what's current. Well, what's officially known as the jazz center for the new york philharmonic it's it's known as a jazz hall it's where like all the jazz musicians come to play but the new york philharmonic's um main home at lincoln center is currently being renovated so they're having to play at different venues around the city like in a rotation because their main home is off limits currently so they're they're kind of they got a few different satellite locations that they've been playing at the last year or so, and one of those locations is this, um, this officially this jazz hall that can seat you know like you know about half the number of people that their normal uh, hall can fit. But it's a new location that I've never heard the orchestra play at before. So I thought, oh, you know, why not check it out and see what it's like? It's probably yeah. the only time I'll ever get the chance to do that. So. Um, that's what I'm going to be doing in a couple of weeks. <clears throat> Maybe someday I'll actually get there to see an actual jazz concert, but, uh, until then. Yeah. <clears throat> yes, well, uh, here, yeah, you see, uh, 270, um, and think, you know, basically after we get under this, I want to say is you're. I want to say you're driving under the convention center. Yeah. Um, you know, you see the uh, power and light district. You'll see a bunch of uh, towers, which I think are actually. Uh, and I think is actually an old uh, power station. Yeah. So the the convention center is what bridges the interstate here. Um, and you have the uh, Kaufman Center of the Performing Arts at one end. Yep. And then you have, um, yeah, you know, basically the Grand Ballroom, the Convention Center, and you know what have you. And so you'll notice as you're driving, and this is actually it's it's actually uh, actually now I'm looking at kind of like a different aerial of it. It's like these four power structures, but they're actually it's actually on top of the roof of the convention center. Maybe just kind of to give a hit that you're in the power and light district. Yeah, I don't know the exact motivation behind that design. Um, it's definitely unique. Yeah, and I'm not even sure if those are necessarily structural or key to the structure, but it's basically like the as you know, the convention center bridges the interstate and the roof appears to be supported by what looks like a cable stay structure above the roof um, with the towers. And then you have the cables that radiate out from the towers. I don't know if that's necessarily key to structural support or if that's all ornamental, but um, there aren't too many structures or buildings in america that quite look like that that's for sure <clears throat> especially over an interstate yeah yeah it, it's it's unusual that's for sure um us 169 was an honorable mention in our powerpoint and it's really unfortunate because i would have liked to have spent a lot more time talking about it but i'll just compensate by with that excuse me i'll compensate for that um by showing you this video instead <clears throat> i'm sure you guys will forgive me 
I think you were saying that there's a, a nice view of downtown from uh, 169. Yeah, this is a this is a fun little drive. Um, I mean, it's got that view of town, and it's got the bridge. It's got the Buck O'Neill Bridge. Um, so yeah, I I thought it was really neat. And you know when you when you're clinching interstates and all that. Yeah, you know, a lot of times you'll see some great stuff and you'll see great views and all that. But if you had just stuck to the interstate system, you would not see this view. Um, and that's too bad because it, it's actually one of the better views of the whole city uh, as you approach it. Um, sometimes you got to get off the main highways and see stuff from other angles, see stuff from the... If not the secondary routes, then the routes that are kind of off to the side that are that are that might be freeways, but are not part of the main uh, interstate system. Um, and that's kind of what I, I suppose I've always tried to do with the channel is kind of give people a more broad, uh, well-rounded view of of a metro area as opposed to just covering all the greatest hits of a city. Um, so that's what I tried to do again in this case, and you know, again with with a drive on with a drive like this on 169, you know, this is not something that you can see on any other any of the interstates. Um, so it's definitely worth the detour off the beaten path to check this one out. <clears throat> but um, Doug, what is um? What's in your pipeline as far as um, blog posts are concerned and podcast episodes and stuff like that? You know, like I was mentioning that I'm working on a couple of uh, articles about uh, one was uh, the Bailey Hayes in uh, Road in Vermont that I'm working on and the uh, Bridges of Madison County uh, and then the, another thing in US 26 in Oregon. Um, I've uh, kind of done a big project, well, not really a big project, but um, an ongoing project of uh, basically writing about the covered bridges. Um, I'm doing a lot in you know, New England and Pennsylvania. Of course, I have stuff in New York. I have in Maryland. going to do a little bit more uh, podcast episodes with uh, some of the covered bridges in different states. Like I did one in Maryland, but I think next I'm going to work on... Uh, you know, Maine, uh, Massachusetts, and, you know, places like that, um, as far as doing episodes, because they don't have a lot of historic covered bridges. Um, the other thing I was looking at doing was a, uh, kind of like a state, uh, statewide overview on the roads of Vermont as a podcast episode, something with the, um, Adirondacks is another one, um, that I was thinking about as well, so... That's just some of the things I'm, you know, kind of cooking right now. And then, of course, you have a lot of stuff which uh, kind of on the drawing board or, you know, basically just haven't gotten around to yet. I, I would estimate with all the pictures I have and all the material I have, um, without adding anything, without, like, going out and seeing anything new, um, I, I'll be pretty busy for, for at least the rest of the decade. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, was, I thought you were going to say, like, rest of the year, but okay. No, uh, decade. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I got to double check to see just how long my uh, YouTube video backlog is. Because we're now, it's now 2022, and... I bet you there's enough stuff to keep me at the rate I'm uploading right now busy until at least 2025. Yeah, because I remember you were saying that, uh, yeah, obviously you have stuff from some of your recent trips, but you also have uh, stuff that just, you know, never really has gotten around to being posted. Yeah, I keep, uh, I keep going away on trips. That probably doesn't help. But, um, yeah, so just a lot of really good stuff gets left by the wayside. And, um, I don't, 
I don't really think I did a whole lot of uploading, if any, of the Kansas City stuff last year. Um, or maybe I did. You know, I don't even fucking remember. But um, the thing is that a lot of this stuff is going to end up in the drawer because I'm, I'm moving from the Carolinas right into Atlanta stuff. So it's going to be... You know, a lot of the a lot of the KC stuff is gonna get left behind. Also, but that's what happens. You know, when you go away so often and you have so many different cities that you're visiting, and it's hard to it's hard sometimes to kind of figure out what gets uploaded and what gets shelved. But um, yeah, because I know that with me, uh, basically, I don't really have kind of. I don't really do a lot of things on a set schedule or like or a chronological schedule. I will, you know, add things as I want to. Basically, if I'm like, oh, I feel like working on this, I'll work on that, and you know, basically, I'll kind of like bounce bounce around the map, so to speak. Yeah, yeah. Well, the good thing is that um, if I and we're watching I-229 in St. Joseph, Missouri right now. Um, if in a few years I stop traveling on a regular basis and I settle down and get a life at some point, then uh, I will uh, have enough stuff to keep me busy for a few years after that. So right. that's good. Um, I know that uh, you know Adam and I have joke, joked about this over uh, the years that we need interns. <laughs> well you might especially for your uh blog site yeah yeah i don't know that i would want to entrust my stuff to interns but um yeah i can see how you guys are going to need a secretary at some point to sift through all the stuff you guys have compiled over the years but yeah as far as i'm concerned you know the it, doug i was talking to you off the air about you know, podcast episodes and recording stuff for use and for publication later. You know, not necessarily yeah. to record and release within the same week, but, you know, record a bunch of different episodes that are about topics that are not really time sensitive. Um, so there's an episode, I'll give you an example. So there's an episode that I recorded recently about... Um, Interstate 26 between South Carolina and Tennessee. That was recorded with the idea that I could release it at some point in the future, like in the perhaps even in the distant future. Um, it's an all inclusive description and review and discussion of the history of that interstate's planning and development and construction. Um, that's a very neutral kind of topic to discuss, and it's one that can be released for public consumption really any time. You know, whether right. it's tomorrow or six months from now. So, um, episodes like that, I'm looking to really um, develop and record in the next few weeks while things are still quiet on the work and the home front. Um, Adam and I have talked multiple times. And I kind of have to get on him again about this. But we've talked about recording at least an episode or perhaps even a series of episodes about uh, the North Carolina interstate system. Um, that's something that I really want to pursue with him. Um, Laura Pruitt, Mrs. M.D. Rhodes, I'm looking to do something with her at some point for the podcast. Um, I want to do something with our mutual friend Corco about Idaho. Um, so I'm looking to record something about that. I'm also looking to do a, um, not so fresh drives episode about Delaware yep. that, that I keep putting off. I've been putting that off for about a year and a half. Well, you know why um, it's called fresh drives? I don't know. Cause my you... middle initial is E. Well, I don't know that you ever. Dougie fresh. <laughs> <laughs> well, cause I don't know that you ever actually explained what that was, where you got that idea from. I kind of took it from, well, kind of my name almost. The Dougie Fresh Drives? Yeah. Yeah, okay. All right. But um, I know that, you know, I've talked, and 
talk to you about this, you know, kind of off the air, um, you know, the kind of how we're, there's an updating season and then there's a travel season. And, you know, basically recording a bunch of things in advance, you know, when it's quiet is good, you know, because you can space it out. And, you know, I do, I do uh, listen to uh, the podcasts, um, you know, as I drive places. Um, I usually save it for, you know, when I go on a, uh, a trip. So I'll be listening to the Super Bowl episode uh, tomorrow, for instance. Oh, you saved it for tomorrow, huh? Yeah, that, you know, I usually save it for when I for when I'm driving. Okay. Yeah, because I I know when um, when Adam put out a couple of episodes recently, I I saved those for um, days when I knew I would be uh, doing some driving, and um, it's good to listen to something intelligent in my car speakers. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Right. I mean, the, the other thing is there's, I mean, you have a lot of, you know, you have blog, you know, some people have blogs, some people have YouTube channels of, you know, roads they film, uh, some people have Instagram accounts, uh, but mm. you really don't come across many podcasts about roads. And I think Gribble Nation is the only uh, road roads podcast there currently is. Yeah, when we well, I know that when we started it, it was the only one, right? And right. I'm fairly certain that nobody else has joined the fray, at least not to this point. Yeah, well, you listen to a bunch of you know travel podcasts, but they're not about the roads; they're about like going places and like Rick Steves, for instance, you know, Rick Steves, you know, Europe, uh, he has a lot of, he has a very good travel podcast that I listen to and he has weekly episodes on that. So, yeah, but, you know, so that you have that angle, but, you know, we, we are, you know, we don't really have many things that come from, you know, a road angle. And I encourage people if they're interested, uh, you know, basically, you know, give it a shot, you know, the anchor, you know, we use anchor FM as kind of our platform for the podcasts. And, you know, it's, I find it's very user friendly and it's also, it's free to use. Yeah. It's free to use. It's easy to navigate. It's easy to learn how to get the gist of, uh, you can utilize their own, uh, transition and sound bites for your own podcast you can also do what i've done which is import your own sound bites in to help customize your own uh right. experience um and i've got more sound bites coming out too soon by the way um but uh yeah it, it's it's a really it's a really simple system to use and um considering that a year and a half ago, I never in a million years thought I would be the one of the main contributors to a road enthusiast podcast. Um, I've really taken to it and I've really enjoyed it. It's been a you lot know of fun. whose idea that was originally I Corcos. Think, yeah, I, I think he was the first one who brought it up, right? Yeah, yeah. And I think it was more because he wanted to hear Adam and I go back and have banter. Well, you guys still need to do a lot of that. Yeah. You know, there, <laughs> yeah, there needs to be, I think you said that there was, um, there was something, you were talking about something in an episode about like hockey and travel and stuff like that. And the, the thing that I immediately thought about was, well, Doug and Adam can talk for an hour and a half just about their experiences with the Carolina Hurricanes. There was one uh, game we went to, and this was against uh, the Florida Panthers when uh, Yarmir Yager played. Uh, so it was, uh, you know, a Adam's friend Joe, who's a Penguins fan, uh, Steve from AlpsRoads.net and I were kind of sitting like a couple rows from the ice. And, you know, I'm wearing an Islanders jersey, Steve's wearing a Rangers jersey, and, uh, you know, Joe's wearing a Penguins jersey. And we're, you know, all yelling stuff at Yarmy Yager, basically calling him old and yelling Medicare and AARP and uh, bouncing back into life with Depends and stuff like that. And uh, I guess the alignment came up to Adam. He's like, he's like, look, he's like, why is an Islander, a Penguin, and a uh, Ranger fan, uh, you know, why, uh, 
you know, basically at this game and, you know, chanting stuff at Yarmir Yager, and you know, he thought it was very funny. <laughs> An NHL linesman, we got the attention of. Wow. That's, that's cool. Yeah. Yeah, there, there are a lot of stories that you, Doug, and Adam could just sit and just talk about for the podcast. You could just sit, you know, you could hit the record button and say, okay, go. You know, right, and, just, <laughs> and you could you could make a series out of it. Really, I mean, the two of you would just well, the two of you really go back to the very beginning of the established road enthusiast community. Right, so, you know, you guys have an endless amount of stuff that you could talk about and yeah. reminisce about I, and all that stuff. And I talk too about you know basically something I'd like to do uh, is you know you do podcasts you know basically we talk about the history of the hobby you know the history of road meets and things like that i think that's the best format to do it in actually yeah you know i'm glad you mentioned that because i was kind of wondering like what if anything ever came of the idea of doing a um like a documentary Right, I know we were talking about doing a documentary on that as well, um, but I think it's you know basically more of like I think the best way is kind of like having a uh, a roundtable discussion is you know basically get a bunch of people uh, together and you know discuss these things. I think that's a good way because the, you know that the the hobby has some history to it and it's not really well documented. I, you know, people know about MTR and eventually into the forum and, you know, basically things like that. But mm. it's a lot, you know, there's a lot of names and topics and things like that that are worth discussing, you know, basically, you know, worth preserving. Yeah, there, there was so much stuff in the early years of the hobby that wasn't properly archived and preserved. So you have a lot of websites from, like, 2000, like, like late 90s, very early 2000s that were never properly preserved and their contents weren't properly preserved. And um, I don't know if that stuff is retrievable or not, but I just know... You have the Wayback Machine. Well, yeah, I mean, in some cases you have that, but you know, I, I fear that some of our early history is, is being erased because it's not being um, kept up. And this is one way right. to kind of help preserve that. Um so yeah, I I would I would definitely like to. I mean, I was in favor of the documentary idea too when it was put forth, but uh, right, you know, I I I would like to see this stuff get talked about, the stuff get put on tape or whatever has to happen in order for us to have a record of what took place over the course of the last twenty five years or whatever. Um, it's all worth talking about and all worth all worth preserving. You know, Steve Anderson's NYCRose.com turns 25 years old this year. Yeah, it's celebrating what? It's a golden jubilee or something like, or a silver jubilee. Yeah, so, I mean, that that's that's a big that's a big deal. It's a big milestone in our history. And, um, you know, I, I've always been one who has had a passion for historic preservation. And you can kind of draw a parallel between, you know, historic preservation of bridges with historic preservation of the early years of our hobby when things weren't necessarily documented all that well. Right, and, you know, people were just, you know, starting to discover, oh, there's more people who share this interest in basically piecing everything together. Yeah. Yeah, like those, but but like those are the years and those are the websites that I remember the most because those were the websites that I discovered first. Right. So, like in my generation, you know, you're a few years older than me, but for my generation, I I first really discovered the hobby like around 2001, 2002, somewhere around there. But that was when all of those websites really started to appear you know, that were dedicated to roads. Some of them were on a national scale. Most were on a regional or local scale. But, you know, you had a, you had a lot of diversity there as far as, you know, websites and their coverage and their, you know, the people who created them, of course, had their own personalities. Um, and it's those sites in particular that I'm particularly interested in revisiting. 
uh, as part of this. And it's that and it's that content in particular also that's most prone to being erased. Um, right. So, you know, I, 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 I'm passionate about trying to preserve the history and, you know, I, I would like to see, I would like to see us, maybe this is the, the proper forum for maybe the, the podcast is maybe even, you know, this YouTube channel is, I don't know, but yeah, um, you, we need to fight. We need to figure out a proper forum for kind of getting, getting our ducks in a row and kind of documenting all of this stuff in a proper format, you know, from a historical perspective so that future people who come into the hobby later can have a place to go to say, Oh, Hey, here, look, you know, learn about the embryonic stages of the road enthusiast community's development in the late nineties or whatever, you know? Right. And I know that, uh, Karumi, uh, dot com, Scott Oglesby, he was, you know, the one who, try to get people to, uh, you know, basically start uh, state uh, uh, web pages. Uh, like, for instance, you know, he has the Connecticut uh, roads page. And then uh, Jeff Kitzko, he did Pennsylvania. He actually still does Pennsylvania highways. Uh, just That's just one example um, that's still there. And, you know, you have uh, some... Uh, you know, state state pages that you know basically were maintained for a while, but you know, whoever was working on it way back when is no longer maintaining it, or possibly may not possibly may not even be alive anymore. Some of these people either. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know that a lot of the, at least a couple of the photographers from. Yeah, you know, like the seventies and whatnot are no longer with us. But yeah. Right. Um But yeah, I mean that that's you know, the historical the the telling of the story, right? Like Gribble Nation is about telling stories and I think the biggest story right. we could possibly tell is the story of the road enthusiast community. Right. And um you know, I've been really big about promoting road meets and preserving the the uh, the road meet itineraries and preserving the, you know, the arrangements of those meets, whether it was the one I did in Wilmington last year, or it was the one I did in Elmsford in September of last year. I think it was in October. Or whenever the hell it was. Yeah, it was, it was in that general. It was a real road year. meet. It was a real road meet. And I will say that <laughs> until the day I'm dead. Um, I don't care what anybody says. Um, or you have the the Philly uh, national meet coming up in August. Yeah, well, um, I believe that's a real meet too, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, or the uh, meet I'm having at the beginning of April in uh, Connecticut. Yeah, yeah, but like, the, I guess the point here is that yeah, you know, every yeah, you, know, you could talk about websites, but also meets are a part of the history too, and right. the different kinds of meets that we've had, the different locations we've had. I mean, the Elmsford meet was held at a construction site, you know, which is very unusual. That's worth preserving, you know, in the discussion. Because, just because of how rare it is for a meet to be held in a place like that. Um, and, you know, just the diversity of locations, the diversity of people who have come, the diversity of the different landmarks we've seen on meets. Um I mean, hell, you could just do a you could do a podcast series just on the history of road meets, right? Uh, well, I know that uh, you know, it used to be a uh, web page uh, where there was archived pictures of the basically the road meet, at, basically the people who were at the road meet. So you basically, you know, how you take a picture of you know everyone was at the meet, kind of like a group photo. There was a collection of photos for that. Um, that actually was. Uh, I think Pete Jenner um, was the person who did that um, page, and uh, for a while was hosted on Gribble Nation uh, .net, which uh, was one of the, uh, you know, part of I want to say Gribble Nation version point one. Right. Basically, um, before we kind of went to the blog uh, format, I actually still have those photos floating around my hard drive because I backed up everything from that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I know that one of the things that I really appreciate about Steve Alpert's site is that he has done the work of preserving the road meet footage that he was a part of 
right like all the meets that he attended he has all the pictures he has the meat photos and he at least has a general description of what the meat was about and where where the lunch was and what the tour included and stuff like that so you know what i'm looking to do is kind of start with that and then kind of work to the other stuff that's happened over the years you know and see just how many of these meats we can um unearth and maybe who knows maybe there are meets that you went to doug that you don't even remember that you went to that had i have no a pretty sharp mind stuff. so well okay <laughs> fine but you know <laughs> see the thing the problem with me is that i go to so many different events and i go to so many different cities over the course of a calendar year that they all just kind of blend into one just huge event yeah, and it's hard to exactly remember exactly what I've done, and you know, you know all that, all that jazz. But perhaps that's another motivation for doing this. You know, just to kind of, you know, get everything out in the open and put it all in one source, so that people can kind of see it um, in one big package, and they can browse, you know, until uh, they can't stand it anymore. So, but, uh, this has been an interesting discussion, Doug. I didn't expect to go off on this tangent, but, um, you know, I, it, historical preservation with respect to the road enthusiast community is something that I'm really passionate about. And right. uh, I have made my point clear on the forum in the past about where I stand on it. And, um, I would like to see somebody take the next step, whether it's GribbleNation.org, whether it's the podcast or friends of the podcast and blog. Um, you know, much like how Tom and I are kind of grabbing the blog by the horns with the Hawaii series, you know, I think that we have an opportunity here to really tell the story of the hobby, which I think is kind of. If there's one story that I would want to tell next after I've seen to it that my Hawaii stuff is preserved on the blog, um, that's kind of the direction that I would like to go in. Yeah, because I mean, there's you know a lot of, a lot of events, a lot of personalities. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's I think that's a, you know that's a good way to put it, but that's also a kind of a nice way to put it for some people, but. But yeah, basically, you know, there's a lot of you know, a lot of personalities involved too. So yeah, there's no shortage of that. That's for sure. But um, yeah, I think on that note, as we as we watched a few miles of 435 near Overland Park, Kansas, I think uh, I think this is a good opportunity to close up shop for the night. Um, yeah, we've gone on for about three hours here, which is. And to tell you the truth, that's about what I expected this to be for this particular show, because Kansas City has, just has so much stuff to talk about. Um, but we managed to navigate it all, and we did it here um, with the help of yours truly and also Doug from GribbleNation.org, who was kind enough to join us on a Friday night to get this show out to you guys. So thank you, Doug, for... Uh, for volunteering your time, I will now let you go and watch the New York Islanders uh, without further ado. I uh, see. I, I I'm curious to see because uh, I haven't even checked the score yet. I just want to see you know if they're oh the I guess Edmonton yeah they have a new head coach. Oh, well that that, that um so good. maybe that's not good news for the Islanders who are currently losing one nothing about halfway through the second. Oh, okay. Well, Up yeah. in the the Rogers, uh, I think Rogers Arena Center in Edmonton. There's a lot of uh, sporting venues in Canada called uh, named after the Rogers uh, Communications uh, Corporation. Yeah, there's a bunch of them, right? There, you know, in Toronto and Vancouver and Edmonton and probably a few places that I can't think of off the top of my head. Well, I know you're very excited because the Montreal Canadiens also have a new head coach. Uh, they hired some guy named uh, Martin St. Louis. Uh, Martin St. Louis. Yeah, whatever his name is. 
Well, I uh, believe uh, his, uh, you know, they, uh, I believe his kids went to uh, the Brunswick School in uh, Greenwich, Connecticut. Yeah. So our, our friend Rob Adams uh, might have uh, called a, a few games uh, with uh, some of Martin Louis's uh, kids. I, I, yeah, I think he I'd did. have to ask him. I think you're right, yeah. I know he was mentioning that the other day. Yeah. Um, but yes, that, that'll be interesting to see how that works out. Yeah. Um, and, 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 and added to the box higher. Um, you know, yeah, I mean, sometimes the best hires are the ones that are out of the box. Yeah. You know, so, yeah, you never know. You know, hopefully it works out well for them. I know that's kind of a rough place to get your coaching debut out of the way. You know, Montreal yeah. is not an easy place to play and coach to begin with, with the media right. there. But, um, I don't know, maybe, maybe he's got the guts to be able to handle it. We'll see. Yeah. Well, Doug, thank you for this special Friday episode. This was great. Uh, thank you to everybody in the live chat who watched us live, and thank you to all of you who will watch us in future days and weeks and years ahead. I hope you enjoyed this episode, and thank you for watching. With a special thanks to, of course, uh, you guys in the live chat and also our panelists who helped us get through this special Friday night episode. We look forward to another live episode coming up on February 26th, featuring Seattle, Washington. Really looking forward to that. And until then, we're going to sign off. Um, and uh, good luck to the teams and the contestants in the Super Bowl. And um, we'll talk to you all again next time. So thank you. All right, have a good one. Have a good one. All right, Doug.